Hello Ralph Hindi ko narinig sarili ko pero Please tell me if you can hear me Pai comment na lang if you can hear me I can't hear myself Okay, good. Thank you. All right. Wait now. Sikalanto. So, we'll wait for the others once they're here. Pero parang may delay to at our sige, we'll see. Okay. Ang problema. Wait lang, wait lang. Alright. We can hear you po, sir. Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to my first ever YouTube live. Okay, so as explained in the class earlier um, I was supposed to record this and then upload this as a separate video, the usual videos that I upload pero hindi ko siya hindi ko siya na save so kaya I decided to explore the live feature of YouTube and then hopefully once this is done it's part of my playlist in YouTube tapos everybody can, well for those who would like to watch the video then they can just click on the this this live no so ayan Mr. Opilanyo actually tama naman yung napasukan mo kanina Mr. Opilanyo uh <laughs> alay di pa ako ready okay wait lang mukha natatakpan kasi yung mukha ko dito sa gilid oh wait lang ay hindi na lang pala wait i have to check ay hindi na lang pala ayan okay Alright. Sige, sige. I'll start na. So, medyo dumadami na tayo. We're 19. 20. Ayan. The aim is 1 million views. <laughs> Joke lang. <laughs> Ivan Alawi, kabahan ka na. <laughs> okay. Alright. So, welcome everybody. Um, this is part two of the obligations and contracts lecture. The first video was uh, on obligations and in this second part, we will talk about contracts. Now, I'd like to thank everybody uh, who's uh, watching the, the, the live stream and also everybody who would watch this after the live stream. So, if you are new to the channel, uh, I'm attorney Al Jumrani. Um, I'm a law professor at the University of the East, among other law schools. And I made this lecture video uh, primarily for my students at UE Civil Law Review uh, 2. And also, I'd like to share this for uh, the bar reviewees, uh, law students, and just about anyone who wants to know more about the law on contracts. Okay, so... If you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing to my channel and please click that notification bell so that you will be notified in case I upload a new video. Ayan. Okay, so last uh, video or last lecture on obligations on uh, obligations and contracts, I left some questions and I think the students who gave their answers in the comment section but uh, my take on those questions are as follows. So previously, I gave these questions and so I will now uh, read them and also answer them. So remember the first question was, Attorney Campos was one of the incorporators of ABC Corporation. From 2005 to 2010, he was the president and chairman of the board. In 2010, he sold majority of his shares and became a minority stockholder. He was not elected to the board but was permitted to attend the meetings by the former chairman for his significant contributions to the company. During the stockholders meeting in 2017, 
the board was reorganized with a new chairman and new directors and new directors attorney campos went to attend the first board meeting but was denied entry he insisted claiming that he has the right to attend and the board obligation to permit him to attend so what are the sources of obligations there are five sources of obligations we have the law contract quasi contract quasi delict and delict okay so everybody knows that and it was also discussed or these sources were also discussed in the previous video now in the case above does attorney campus have a right and the abc corporations board the obligation to allow him to attend the board meeting explain we said that obligations must be sourced from any of the uh, sources of obligations whether it's law contract quasi contract quasi delict or delict and if there's an obligation in favor of a certain person or a certain party then the other party has the right to demand it now in in this problem there was no right to demand that obligation because attorney campus was not elected to the board under your corporation law uh, a stockholder may only be allowed to sit in the board if he is appointed in the stockholders meeting or in the annual stockholders election for uh, the board of directors so that's why since there is no right either granted by law contract quasi contract or quasi delict or delict then there is no obligation on the part of the board to allow him to attend the board meeting and so that was that is the answer to this question now the second question is julius opened a savings account with xyc bank in 2015 in 2017 he applied for a housing loan from the same bank last year julius defaulted xyz bank then applied the balance in julius's savings account to pay for the amortizations of the housing loan julius questioned this claiming that he did not give his consent so question what is compensation or set off as a mode of extinguishing obligations well we learned in the previous video that compensation or set off as a mode of extinguishing obligation cancels out concurring obligations of two persons who are or, or two parties who are creditors and debtors of each other now we have to uh, remember or state the requisites or elements of legal compensation so aside from being creditors and debtors of one another the obligations must be in a sum of money and also the obligations must be due demandable and liquidated and lastly there must be no dispute or any legal issue involving the two amounts to be set off in this case <clears throat> so in the case above was xyz bank correct in applying compensation or set off why yes xyz bank was correct in applying compensation or set off because xyz bank was the creditor of julius as far as the housing loan is concerned julius on the other hand was the creditor of xyz bank with respect to the savings account which julius had with uh, xyz bank so we said that law the law that applies uh, to uh, bank deposits is the law on loans in other words um, it's just in the name that it is called a bank deposit but technically it is a contract of loan the relationship between the depositor and the bank is that of a creditor and debtor that's why the bank pays interest for the use of the deposits of the depositor so because the elements of legal compensation are present thus xyz bank was correct in applying compensation or set off okay the last question was norma's salon incorporated was buried in debts Unlike five years ago, the salon was now facing tough competition from Bench Fix and Bruno's Barbers, to name a few. In an effort to reduce its ballooning debts, Norma Salon delivered by way of Dashan and Pago 20 salon seats and 10 hair blowers to its principal creditor, China Bank. The items were collectively valued at 700,000 pesos. Seven months after, China Bank found that some of the salon seats and hair blowers were defective. China Bank sued Norma Salon Incorporated for breach of warranty against hidden defects. What is Dashon in Pago as a mode of extinguishing an obligation? At the show, in Dashon in Pago, the debtor delivers a determinate thing to the creditor as payment for the unpaid obligation. 
and we said that in the show in pago we applied the law on sales now for the second question is in the case above is china bank correct in invoking the warranty against hidden defects explain it is true that uh, since the law on sales applies to a dashon in pago thus warranty against hidden defects may also apply however remember that the warranty against hidden defects does not apply to second hand articles and in this case the salon seats and hair blowers were second hand articles thus china bank cannot insist on the warranty against hidden defects in order to um, rescind the contract or rescind the dashon in pago okay so that's the answer Alright, so let me check. Ilan na po tayo? 40. Okay, so hello everybody. Ayan, daming present. Okay. So Sandra, pasabihan yung mga nagtataka bakit wala tao sa Google Meet. Ha, naandito tayo lahat ngayon sa YouTube. Yung mga, hin sino, kaya, sino kaya nanonood na hindi ko isudyante, no? So if you're uh, joining us, this live stream, and you're not part of the Civil Law Review 2 class of UE College of Law, welcome to my uh, lecture on the law and contracts. Ayan. Okay, so I hope you enjoy your stay here, and I hope you will learn something, if not uh, a lot, from this um, lecture. Okay. So let's now proceed. If you're ready, let's do this. So what is a contract? A contract is a meeting of the minds with respect to the other to give something or to render some service. Now from this definition, we have the three important keywords, meeting of minds, parties, and obligation. If you have to define a contract or if you will be asked to define a contract, make sure that you have all three keywords okay, in the subject or in the uh, in the definition okay now note however that despite the phraseology which suggests that only one party has an obligation a contract essentially involves reciprocal obligations that's why the definition provided by the civil code has been criticized because it appears that or it implies that a contract of uh, or a contract only suggests that there's only one party or that a contract is unilateral but it is not unilateral but nevertheless the definition is correct because in a contract uh, each party would be uh, bound to perform his obligation so each side would be an independent um, independent part of the contract so as far as let's say one prestation is concerned so you have a creditor debtor with respect to the other prestation naman yung sa kabila you also have the creditor or debtor now to to better understand this uh, we can just you know use or point to common contracts like a contract of sale a contract of lease a contract of loan okay so a contract of sale uh, applying the general definition of a contract it's a meeting of the minds so there's an agreement okay in a contract of sale now with respect to the other so you have one party so let's use the seller or the vendor and with respect to the other he promises to give something or to render some service so what is this obligation the obligation of the seller to the buyer is to transfer ownership and to deliver the thing okay so tama naman yun. but then when we look at the other part of the contract which is that prestation of the buyer then we also have uh, this different context so with respect to the seller the buyer has the obligation to pay the price so can okay, reciprocal obligations uh, that's why a contract involves reciprocal obligations okay now there are of course unilateral agreements or unilateral transactions like in the case of um, a donation but donation is an altogether different concept because here there is no obligation on the part of the donor to give something or to render some service to the donee neither is there an obligation on the part of the donee to give something or to render some service to the donor you know a donation is based on gratuity or liberality on the part of the donor so he gives it away or the thing or he gives away the thing uh, out of his uh, magnanimity or out of his altruism and then the donor simply accepts that 
and uh, if you can call that an obligation then that is the obligation to accept the donated thing or the thing subject of the donation okay now let's uh, look at the characteristics of contracts okay so the next slide shows the different characteristics of contracts and these characteristics are relativity obligatoriness consensuality mutuality and autonomy when presented with a question whether the contract is valid it's not enough that you look at the elements or the requisites of the contract or that you uh, see if the three keywords are present Kumbaga, uh, your meeting of the minds the, the parties as well as the obligation but also read the terms or understand the terms and conditions of the contract and see if these terms and conditions meet or comply with the different characteristics of a contract so parang kumbaga sa taxation if tax is the lifeblood of the government meron din tayong basic catch all defense or catch all argument for uh, questions on or involving validity of contracts so to to know if the contract is valid you must test that contract against these characteristics of contracts so what are these characteristics so let's start with relativity so when we speak of relativity we remember article 1311 of the civil code so article 1311 of the civil code states that contracts produce effect as between the parties who execute them in other words contracts are binding only among or upon the parties who are privy to the contract so a stranger has no business uh, dealing or interfering or demanding benefits from the contract okay? because if you are not a party to the contract then the contract does not bind you neither do you have any right uh, to demand anything from the parties to the contract now this is borne by the doctrine of res inter alios acta which states that a contract cannot adversely affect the rights of one who is not a party to the contract but there are exceptions to the res inter alios acta rule first is when the party executing the contract is an agent in which case his principal is the real party in interest so the other party to the contract can demand performance not or maybe uh, from the agent as well as from the principal because i say maybe because that agent may also be authorized to perform the obligations of the principal in that contract okay but at any rate the agent is only an alter ego of the principal so his principal is not a third party to the contract he is not a stranger thus he is not a governor he is not affected by the res inter alios acta rule now the next exception is that rights and obligations may be transmitted to heirs and assigns of the parties to the contract so that's a general rule in civil law of rights and obligations are generally transmissible but there are exceptions to the transmissibility of rights and obligations so what are these intransmissible contracts so first these are contracts which are purely personal okay so what are examples of contracts that are purely personal we have a contract of partnership and a contract of commodatum these contracts are purely personal because the death of one of the parties to the contract extinguishes or terminates the contract or the relationship of the parties there is no right of succession in a partnership nor in commodatum so let me explain in a partnership if a partner dies the partnership is dissolved because the heirs of the of the deceased partner cannot take his place in the said partnership it is different in the case of a corporation because in a corporation the death of a stockholder does not dissolve the corporation the uh, deceased stockholder can be um, replaced by his heirs or in fact uh, before he died he could have uh, executed uh, let's say a transfer or um, a contingency 
such that in case of his death, his uh, shares may be acquired by the corporation and the corporation will exercise the rights pertaining to those shares. That's possible in corporations. But in a partnership, the death of a partner um, dissolves the partnership and uh, his interest in the partnership is not transferred or inherited by his heirs. Now, in the case of commodatum, remember that commodatum, or at least the obligations and the rights and obligations in a commodatum are based on trust and confidence. So, a, a, a bailor will lend uh, the thing to a bailey because he believes that the bailey can return the thing once uh, the bailor demands the return of the thing. And uh, this trust and confidence may be based on the personal characteristics of the bailey. Halimbawa, napagka mapagkakatiwalaan siya, he has a good um, um, you know, background as far as diligence over uh, personal properties or even real properties, if real property is the subject of the komodatum. So, kung pinahiram niya dito sa isang tao na to, yung bagay na yun, it doesn't mean that the thing will also be taken care of by another person. So, kaya if the bailey or the borrower dies, then the contract is extinguished and the thing must be returned to the bailor. And the same thing is true if the bailor dies. So, if the bailor dies, then the bailey has to return the thing to the heirs of the bailor. Okay, so basically that's it. No examples of intransmissible contracts. Now, another exception uh, to the Ris Inter Alius Acta rule is the stipulation for a truie. So what is stipulation for a truie? It is a stipulation in favor of a third person. This is an exception because, as we have said, the contract is only binding upon the parties to the contract. So bakit nagkakaroon ng situation where a third person may demand some interest or may demand some benefit in a contract to which he did not participate or to which he was not a party? Okay, so these are the requisites for a valid stipulation for autrui. So first, there must be a stipulation in favor of a third person. So the third person must be identified and the stipulation or the contract itself must state what kind of benefit or favor will be given to the said third person. Now, the second requisite is that the stipulation must be a part, okay, not the whole of the contract. So if the contract is entirely for the benefit of a third person then uh, it ceases to be a stipulation for a true but rather that becomes the main contract okay so for example in the case of a surety you know, in the case of a surety so you have uh, the principal debtor as the beneficiary of a surety contract but the surety contract involves the creditor and the surety so in that case it ceases to be a stipulation for a true but rather it's the main or the main object of the surety agreement so anyway i will show you uh, examples of a valid stipulation for a true so the other requisites of a valid stipulation for a true are number uh, third is the contracting parties must have clearly and deliberately conferred a favor upon a third person not a mere incidental benefit or interest so, the agreement itself, as I've said, must identify the third person, must specify what favor or benefit will be extended to that person. It is not a stipulation for a truie if the, the said third person is merely, let's say, an heir or an assignee of a party to the contract. Because technically speaking, he is not a third party, but rather a representative or a successor to a direct party to the contract. Okay, so, magiging incidental yun. Dapat talaga there is a uh, deliberate conferment of uh, some benefit in favor of a distinct third person. Okay, next, the favorable stipulation should not be conditioned or compensated by any kind of obligation whatsoever. So, the third person doesn't have to um, assume any obligation. Now, next is that the third person must have communicated his acceptance before its revocation. It being a stipulation by the parties in favor of a third person uh, conditioned upon either the happening of an event or uh, the existence of a right, uh, it can also be revoked no? before the happening of that event or the um, existence of that right. So the third person must accept 
that benefit before its revocation. Otherwise, if it has been revoked, then he ceases to have any interest in that stipulation. Now, lastly, neither of the contracting parties is a representative or agent of the third person. Again, because if he is only, or if this third person is the principal of a party to the main contract, then there is really no third person, but rather that third person is the real party in interest. Okay. So, examples of stipulations for Otrui, sale of real property, but the buyer must pay, must first pay the vendor's loan which is secured by a mortgage on the purchase property so here who is the third person the third person here is the mortgagee or the creditor of the vendor so in the contract between the vendor and the vendee the vendor um, <clears throat> asks the vendee to pay off the unpaid loan on the property so that the proper the mortgage on the property can be released so the agreement is only between is principally between the vendor and the vendee but there's a stipulation there which is the pay off or the uh, settlement of the loan obligation and that stipulation is in favor of a third person which is the mortgagee yeah, so kaya siya stipulation for a true way. It is a stipulation in favor of a third person and that this third person, once of course he accepts it, uh, then of course it can uh, demand the performance thereof uh, from the vendee. Okay? The vendee is bound not only to the sale but also the vendee or the buyer is also bound to pay off that unsettled or unpaid obligation. Now, another example of a stipulation pro truwi is casualty or liability insurance obtained by an employer for the benefit of his employees. So, the main contract is an insurance contract, particularly a liability insurance contract. So, it's a contract between the employer and the insurance company or the insurer. But, the contract is in favor of a third person. Well, third persons to be exact because uh, the beneficiary of that contract are the employees of the employer. Now, of course, it's not automatic. The benefits will only be given to the employees if the liability arises. Kaya nga siya tawag liability insurance because it insures against liability. So, I am supposing that this is liability uh, because it's not employees' compensation. So, hindi ito yung... Um, payment to employees in case of injury while in the performance of their official functions because in that case that would be the main contract but here liability insurance means in case the employees um, commit um, let's say uh, damage or injury to a third person or if let's say while in the performance well, let's say a third person um, commits a negligent act or a malicious act against the employees so the employees will be compensated out of the insurance policy which the employer took from the insurance company ayan so those are examples of a stipulation for otrui okay before i discuss obligatoriness tinawag ko sino anong dito ayan walang bago okay hi hello ulit sa inyo ayan so we are 49 as of the moment and thank you for staying and tapusin natin to alright so 29 minutes into this lecture we are now on the topic of obligatoriness so what is obligatoriness the basis is article 1159 of the civil code and it states that obligations arising from contracts have the force of law between the contracting parties and should be complied with in good faith I mean, uh, the civil code cannot em em cannot emphasize it uh, even more. It says that it's the law between the parties. So the violation of a contract is the same, is almost the same as a violation of the law. Kaya nga siya obligatory. Okay, next is consensuality. So the basis here is Article 1315 of the civil code. And it provides that the binding force of a contract is not limited to what is expressly stipulated but extends to all consequences which are the natural effect of the contract considering its true purpose, the stipulations it contains, and the object involved. Okay, we said that uh, 
a meeting of the minds or the consensuality well generally the parties consent to the object and the compensation or the consideration of the contract like in the case of a contract of sale so the parties must have a meeting of the minds over the thing and over the price but okay that's too simplistic to say that the parties did not also agree to other consequences of the contract so parties to a contract of sale agree to many things as well including for example the execution of a public instrument because by usages and customs as well as by express provision of the civil code particularly article 1358 of the civil code contracts involving sale transfer or uh, conveyance of real property or real interest in property must be in a public instrument okay and uh, later on i will talk about uh, what right is given to a specific party by article 1358 of the civil code but it is there okay so it is something that can be invoked by 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 the parties to a contract of sale now similarly by usages and by related um, law pd 1529 or the presidential decree uh, or the property registration decree requires that uh, for the transfer of title from the seller to the buyer what must be surrendered are the owner's duplicate as well as the proper deed of conveyance so these are requirements that are not specified in the civil code or not um, included in the civil code but are nevertheless demandable so when parties enter to a contract of sale they agree as well to these incidental stipulations or incidental obligations so as a seller although wala sa hindi siya sabi do sa kontrata mo na ibigay mo yung owner's duplicate you also agree impliedly you also agree to this requirement that you have to surrender the owner's duplicate of the certificate of title also similarly on the part of the buyer if for example, um, hindi nakasulat doon sa contract or date of sale niya na mag-issue ka ng resibo, but by usages of trade, no? by, by usages of trade, uh, the seller is or has the right to demand an official receipt. Okay, or oh, sorry, not official receipt, but balik tari ko pala. The seller pala has the obligation to issue an official receipt for purposes of paying off taxes. So, yung mga ganun, kasama na yun doon sa uh, uh, sinasang ayunan ng mga parties okay? those consequential stipulations are included in what will be agreed upon by the parties that's consensuality okay next is mutuality and the basis is article 1308 of the civil code so here the fulfillment of a contract cannot depend exclusively upon the uncontrolled will of one of the contracting parties in other words, a contract is for the benefit of both parties and each party has the expectation that the other will perform his obligation according to what was agreed upon. So, hindi po pwedeng discretionary sa part lang na isang party to a contract yung efficacy ng kontrata. That's why we said in our earlier lecture, a potestative condition is void. Potestative conditions are those conditions the efficacy of which depend solely upon the discretion or the decision of one party. Okay, so a, a potestative condition violates uh, the mutuality principle of a contract. Also, because of this mutuality principle, a contract cannot be unilaterally terminated without the consent of the other unless such privilege is stipulated in the contract but if it's not stipulated in the contract the part one party cannot terminate the contract without the consent of the other and we have discussed this no, about uh, periods no? so similar to the rule on periods we said that a period is for the benefit of both the creditor and the debtor so that's why if the debtor wants to pre-terminate the period he has to get the consent of the creditor because the creditor also has a benefit in that period for example in the case of a loan with interest the longer the period is so the more interest the creditor gets from that uh, amortized payments so that's it
Okay, now let's talk about autonomy. So the basis of autonomy is Article 1306 of the Civil Code. So here, we said that the contracting parties may establish such stipulations, clauses, terms and conditions as they may deem convenient, provided they are not contrary to law, morals, good customs, public order, or public policy. Now, here's the beauty of uh, contract drafting. In contract drafting, um, as a lawyer, you can draft or you can craft okay, such terms and conditions which your clients or which the parties will find convenient. Now, normally, uh, clients will come to you or the parties to a specific contract will come to a lawyer or to a contract drafter and tell the lawyer or contract drafter that ito yung mga gusto naming mangyari. Okay? So, ito yung, yung in-expect ko sa kanya, siya naman, ito naman yung i-expect niya sa akin. So, you make it happen. Okay, so, usually the challenge there is for the lawyer to make it happen legally. In other words, you must have a grasp of kung ano yung bawal. You must have this you know, wide um, knowledge of uh, law, of public policy, etc. Because while it is true that the parties are free to stipulate, pursuant to their freedom to contract and autonomy, that freedom is subject to um, limitation. And that limitation is make sure that it's not contrary to law, morals, good customs, public order, and public policy. So, ano nga ba yung bawal? Uh, Diyan napapasok yung abogado. So, the lawyer should know when or what provisions cannot be, uh, cannot be agreed upon by the parties. Okay. Now, examples of contracts which were voided for being contrary to law or public policy. So, first, a contract of agency for following up papers in the different government offices to which they were referred. Okay, so this is an old case of um, fixing. Yeah. So, we call this a uh, present to mga fixers. Yeah. So, fixing is a void contract. Why is it a void contract? Because number one, it presupposes that the um, person asking you to fix the contract is disqualified to avail of this grant from the government. Also, secondly, it is also against um, public policy, which is that uh, you know government processes should not be the subject of. Um, corruption yeah, or, or uh, shortcuts so this contract was seen as a form of corruption so that's why it was considered void now the other example of a contract which was voided for being contrary to law or public policy was a non-involvement clause or that which indefinitely prohibits an employee from engaging in any business similar to that of his employee after the termination of his employment contract what is void here is not the non-involvement or non-compete clause. What was declared void here was the indefinite prohibition. Because in effect, by saying na hindi po pwedeng magtrabaho sa isang competitor uh, company, yung nag-resign na empleyado, that stipulation now impairs the right to labor or the right to seek employment of that resigned employee. Okay. But the Supreme Court uh, said here that um, non-compete clauses are valid because they make sure that the trade secrets are protected and that the resigned employee will not um, support a competitor and uh, give undue favor to a competitor. But then, that restriction should not be indefinite. So in that uh, case, the Supreme Court said that a uh, an acceptable or permissible prohibition would be from siguro at most two years and if I remember it right uh, but but the Supreme Court said uh, did not say na there is a law that sets hanggang two years lang but based on reasonableness of the prohibition a prohibition of two years would be valid but more than that that would be too harsh and an unfair or an unlawful uh, restriction on the right to labor okay so those are ay meron pa pala alright another example of a contract that was rendered void uh, is a compromise agreement 
for the settlement of an obligation arising out of a void contract okay <clears throat> so here the contract that was deemed void was the compromise agreement you see here the supreme the supreme court applied the rule that the accessory follows the principal so the compromise agreement arose from a void contract so the compromise agreement sought to enforce a right or an obligation arising from a void contract so here the supreme court said that compromise agreement cannot be sustained because it it works like a a, 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 a cure to a void contract and since this compromise agreement arises out of a void contract then we follow the um, we follow the rule that the spring cannot rise above the source okay another example of a contract that was rendered void is any stipulation where the fixing of interest rate is the sole prerogative of the creditor or mortgagee so what was rendered void here was not the fixing of interest but rather the unilateral fixing of interest meaning to say fixing the interest or the, the right is given uh, solely to uh, the creditor now remember our uh, law on loans uh, it provides that interest to be imposed must have been agreed upon in writing so in other words both parties must agree to the stipulation on interest if there is no agreement in writing then the interest cannot be imposed now similarly repricing or adjustment of interest must also be agreed upon by the parties okay now in this case the supreme court however said that what is uh, prohibited is without or is that act of not giving the debtor an opportunity to accept or to reject the adjusted interest rate okay yung unilateral imposition of the interest rate is what is considered void but in this case sabi ng supreme court yung pnb naman may ginawa naman siya na uh, uh, pnb did something or gave the debt or something which makes uh, the imposition of the new rates no longer unilateral so ano yung ginawa ng PNB dito before repricing the interest rate the bank served a notice to the debtor informing the debtor that effective a certain date the interest rates would be adjusted and this interest rate and, and, and that the debtor uh, is given a period to agree or to uh, reject if he if the credit if the debtor rejects the new interest rate then he can choose to pay off the unpaid obligation or to assign or transfer the unpaid obligation to a new creditor and that new creditor will pay off uh, the PNB or the existing creditor so meron siyang way out kung ayaw niya doon sa interest rate now also uh, sabi din doon pag if we do not hear from you after a certain date then we will suppose that you agree to the repriced or the adjusted interest rate so in effect sabi na supreme court ang bawal ay yung sole prerogative pero if the bank or if the creditor um, informs okay reasonably informs uh, the debtor about the adjusted rates then it is no longer a sole prerogative of the creditor because the debtor is now free to accept or to reject the new rates. Ayan. So, anyway, basahin nyo, maganda yung case na yan. Lalo na applicable to sa, kasi maraming nagugulat na, ano ba yan, last year, nasa 6% lang utang ko. Tapos ngayon, 6.5 na. Ayan. Now, even pag-ibig, understand, no, nagre-reprice din sila regularly. Pero I think there was a time na may offer sila na fixed or uniform interest rate for, let's like, say, 5 years. Now, clearly that is uh, a marketing uh, ploy of uh, these financial institutions to attract debtors uh, on the other hand yung iba naman na nagsasabi na 
we reprice every year and that is beneficial to you because pos possibly siyang bumaba, possibly di siyang tumaas. So, it really depends upon market forces as they say. So, nasa debtor na talaga yun. Yung kung alin ang pipiliin niya. Is it the fixed rate or is it the repriced rate which usually is adjusted every year? Okay. Asa importante, sabi ng Supreme Court, i-inform yung debtor before the repricing. Okay. Last is a loan obtained by the municipality for the purpose of funding the conversion of the public plaza which is a property of public dominion into a commercial center sabi ng supreme court this is a void contract because the object is not within the commerce of man in other words it is outside the commerce of man and like uh, other uh, lands of the public domain or public dominion a public plaza cannot be the subject of a private contract Ayan. okay all right what are the elements of a contract Okay, wow, salamat talaga sir Pagpalain pa kayo ng Panginoon Salamat po uh, Andre Portello Thank you for watching Ayan, Keep on watching Ayan. Sige, tuloy na natin So elements of a contract 40, 45 minutes na Nasa elements pa pala tayo Naka 18 slides pa lang ako Alright, so what are the elements of a contract? So the elements of a contract are Consent, object, and cause Now Before I discuss these elements, we have the types of contract according to perfection. Ito muna unahin natin ha. So, real contract is a contract that is perfected upon the delivery of the thing which is the subject matter of the contract. What are real contracts? Examples of real contracts are komodatum, mutuum, deposit, well of course yung mga accessory uh, mga securities contracts of securities like uh, pledge, mortgage, ganyan pero syempre huwag na natin pag-usapan yun dahil nga sa PPSA na yan sa Personal Property Securities Act so ibang, ibang araw na yun ibang video na yun but basically contracts under your credit transactions are real contracts because the contract or the con yes the contract is perfected upon the delivery of the thing so if the thing that is not delivered so in the case of a komodatum if the thing borrowed is not delivered to the borrower in the case of a mutuum if the funds are not released or received by the debtor and let's say in a contract of deposit if the thing meant to be for safekeeping is not received by the depository then there is no contract so they cannot demand from each other the prestations or the expectations in that contract unless and until the thing is delivered okay next would be consensual contracts and consensual contracts are contracts which are perfected upon the meeting of the minds so the bulk or most of the, con the special contracts are consensual contracts so they are perfected by the mere agreement of the parties over the object and over the consideration examples are contract of sale uh, contract of lease contract of partnership contract of agency yeah consensually mga contracts na yan. so for example in a contract of lease the contract Okay, is perfected even before the property is delivered or the lease premises is delivered. So, for example, um, there's a new mall opening in the neighborhood. Tapos, uh, you decided to lease a space there, a commercial space. And so, you are a lessee of that uh, commercial space. Now, what if that building or that mall is still being constructed? and uh, the delivery or the turnover is let's say six months after the execution of the contract are you required as a lessee to pay the rent for uh, the six months before the space or the commercial unit is delivered to you well the answer is yes because generally the obligations of the parties arise from the perfection of the contract and the contract of lease is perfected upon agreement so the lessee should start paying the rent because on the part of the lesser naman the lesser will no longer offer the least premises to a different person so the obligation of the lessee is to pay rent and in exchange to that uh, the lesser has the obligation to guarantee or to assure the lessee the peaceful enjoyment of the thing at ibig sabihin nun, hindi na niya i-offer sa iba 
but because this is a special case where the property being leased is yet to be constructed then the parties can agree na magsisimula yung rent only upon delivery of the property okay so depende sa kanila yon again freedom to contract autonomy of the parties they can agree on such stipulations that are convenient to them okay so the last type of uh, contract is solemn contracts what are solemn contracts solemn contracts are contracts which are perfected upon the execution of the proper form so are there contracts which are required the execution of a proper form bago ito masasabing valid and binding yes there are contracts which require a specific form we will discuss uh, more about forms of contracts after a few slides no? uh, but uh, as an example of solemn contracts you have a contract of agency to sell real property contracts or donations of real property a partnership where real property is contributed yeah, and so this um, are the contracts or examples of contracts which require the execution of a specific form before that contract becomes valid and binding yeah so let's now talk about consent so what is consent well consent it's not it's not just meeting of the minds no it is not as simple as uh, the party saying yes to one another okay if only it were that simple pero just like any other things that you know people agree to like marriage or other relationships may mga requisites yan so first would be the capacity of the parties the parties to a contract must have the capacity to give consent so with respect to natural persons the natural person must at least be of majority age and the majority age is 18 if you were able to watch my uh, recent video on law on persons personality uh, use of surnames and absence then you will know that um, by virtue of the family code and republic act 6809 our majority age is now 18 compared to before at 21 years old so ngayon a person a natural person is deemed capacitated to enter into a contract and give his consent when he reaches the age of 18 but this is not to say na that capacity is permanent because that capacity can also be restricted or modified for example because of um, insanity um, civil interdiction etc but what is important is that at the time of the execution of the contract the parties must have the capacity and in this case the natural person must have the capacity so you must be at least 18 years of age and with full uh, capacity to dispose of his properties Ayan. Ibig sabihin, walang civil interdiction. now with respect to juridical persons the juridical person must be duly constituted in accordance with law so again na discuss na natin to dun sa uh, video ko on law on persons a juridical person is constituted according to the requirements laid down by law so for example a corporation uh, must be duly incorporated but it's not the filing of the articles of incorporation that grants or that um, uh, vests the corporation juridical personality but it is the issuance by the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, of a certificate of incorporation now with respect to a partnership a partnership acquires legal personality upon execution of the agreement so it could be a verbal agreement or it could no if halimbawa mayroong personal uh, kung may real property yun, dapat in writing yun ha? so uh, if there is an article uh, articles of partnership then the execution or the date of the execution of the articles of partnership will be the date of the commencement of the legal personality of the partnership so yun, kailangan, kailangan dun yun dun sa, sa, sa situation when the issue is about the consent now the next uh, thing to consider about consent is that the proper party or person must give consent. Okay? Walang problema pag natural person yan because siya lang naman talaga yun. Diba? But when it comes to uh, or with respect to juridical persons, a juridical person can only act through its authorized representatives. So if it's a corporation, it's the board of directors or board of trustees that has the corporate powers to bind the corporation. So the contract must be executed 
or the consent to the contract must be given by the person authorized by the board okay now with respect to public corporations under the local government code it's the chief executive who has the power to give consent although the authority to give consent must come from the sangguniyan so all these must be taken into consideration to know if um, the proper party uh, uh, if the party signing the contract is in fact the proper party and he is in fact authorized to give the consent for for let's say his uh, organization or his principal okay now take note of article 1317 article 1317 of the of the civil code states a contract entered into in the name of another by one who has no authority or legal representation or who has acted beyond his power shall be unenforceable unless it is ratified okay so that's why bakit kung may isipin nyo, bakit familiar? Because we have a counterpart provision under Article 1403, number 3, uh, no, number 1, ayan, 1403, number 1, on unenforceable contracts. Ayan, so we'll talk about uh, unenforceable contracts uh, also uh, in this lecture, pero mga towards the end na. Okay, uh, under defective contracts. Okay, so let's now talk about offer and acceptance. Okay, in consent, kaya sa sabi meeting of the minds actually hindi naman talaga utak ang nagmi-meet doon no? uh, rather it's the concurrence of offer and acceptance that's what we call meeting of the minds because there is a concurrence of offer and acceptance now first the offer must be definite complete and intentional okay so it cannot be uh, an uncertain or a provisional offer the offeror must must be specific as to what he is offering so that we can also demand from the offeree that his acceptance must be unequivocal unconditional and must not qualify the terms of the offer so an offeree cannot be expected to accept a provisional or an uncertain offer so yung offer pa lang dapat determinate na so that the offeree can accept it as it is okay But it is only when the offeror has notice of the acceptance will the uh, contract arise. So the contract will not arise if the uh, offeror was not aware of uh, the acceptance of the offeree. Now, it is one thing if the parties are face to face and it is another when the parties are in two different places and are merely communicating by correspondence or any other means of communication dun sa una which is pag face to face silence means yes okay pwede na when the offeree did not reject uh, the offer and uh, despite having been given time to make his counter offer he does not make a counter offer his silence will be deemed acceptance for after all they are face to face so your offer mapapansin na niya yung behavior ng offeree on the other hand pag hindi sila face to face silence cannot be taken as an acceptance because the offeror must have notice or knowledge of the acceptance before the contract arises or before the contract is perfected it is important that the offeror is aware or has notice of the acceptance because if he is not aware of the acceptance he can withdraw it thus uh, the last thing to note is that the offeror may withdraw the offer at any time before acceptance Ayan. Hello po, kamusta na po kayo dyan? Ako'y inom mo na ng tubig. <coughs> Ayan, okay. I hope okay lang kayo dyan, ha? Okay. Alright, um, let's now talk about vices of consent. So what are these vices of consent? Also called the defects of consent. Ayan, <coughs> i-memorize nyo to, itong limang to mistake, violence, intimidation, undue influence, and fraud. And, yeah. Ngayon, siyempre, pwede yun may alternate, alternate yan. Pero, um, ang magkakasama dyan, itong violence, intimidation, and undue influence. At saka yung mistake and fraud. Okay. Towards our discussion, mapapasin nyo kung bakit. Okay, sige. Especially because when we talk about voidable contracts, may prescriptive period doon. 
So, yung prescriptive period na yun will be counted upon the accrual of the cause of action. So, kaya magkakasama dyan yung violence, intimidation, and due influence. Samantala, yung mistake at saka fraud, magkasama din. Bakit? Can you guess by now? Well, because the prescriptive period is counted either from the cessation of the violence, intimidation, or undue influence, or the discovery of the mistake or fraud. Okay, ang magkakasama yan. Kailangan pagsamayan niya tatlo. So, let's now look at uh, these vices of consent. So, on mistake or error. So, the mistake or error must refer to the substance of the object of the contract. That is, the nature and conditions of the contract. It must not refer to some expectation, not, uh, not principally related to the contract. Like, for example, bumili ka ng property sa Tanay. Okay, Tanay Rizal. Thinking that you can use it as a mountain resort at uh, tourism business okay but then turns out hindi pumatok yung ano uh, yung yung intention mong business na maging resort uh, maging tourism uh, spot yung yung property mo okay now that mistake or error has nothing to do with your contract it may be your motivation but motivation is different from the cost of the contract your cost there is to acquire the property your motivation is different that's purely personal and it is not contractual but if the mistake is with respect to the thing itself like you thought you were buying a property with an area of 1000 square meters but what you got was only let's say 900 square meters so that is a mistake or error that is substantial so that's a vitiation of, that, that can be a ground for the vitiation of consent but your motivation mo and then unrealize your motivation mo that is not a mistake or error that can uh, annul the contract because it does not go into the substance of the object of the contract now also mistake or error can refer to the qualifications of the other party if such qualification is the principal cause of the contract now this would apply to contract for personal services so for example you are a new condominium owner or condominium property owner and then you were looking for an interior designer so you found this interior designer and this interior designer misrepresented that um, uh, he, he, he or she is uh, a licensed interior designer and so you uh, acted based on that misrepresentation but turns out he doesn't he or she doesn't have that qualification now not only is it mistake or error it is also fraud because there was an overt or an active act on the part of uh, the other party to misrepresent himself as a uh, licensed interior designer when in fact he is not but sa part mo naman mistake and error can ang, ang nangyari with respect to the personal qualifications of the other party and in that case, that is a mistake or error that can be considered as a vice of consent and can be a ground to, nulli to annul the contract. Ayan. Ngayon pala, I have to be very careful to the term because pag sinabi kong annul at saka nullify, magkaiba yun. Pag sinabi mong annul the contract, that contract is voidable. Pag sinabi mong nullify the contract, the contract is void. So pag binaliktad mo yan, magkakamali tayo doon. So again, that's that. That is something we have to live with, especially with um, civil law, no? Because the remedies are different according to the nature or according to what kind of defective contract it is. All right. Now, finally, on mistake or error, uh, the test of the error is its influence upon the party. So if the party would not have entered into the contract had he known the true fact, then that error invalidates the contract. So, yun lang yung test. So, alibawa, ay na nga, yung property. Kung nalaman mo na itong property na to ay less than 1,000 square meters, bibilhin mo ba? So, pag, sinab pag, pag sinabi niya, hindi, hindi ko bibilhin niya kasi ang gusto ko, ang, ang bibilhin ko talaga is 1,000 square meters. So, there is an error. So, pangalawa, alibawa, kung nalaman mo noon pa na hindi pala malalaki ang alon sa sambales at ikaw ay isang frustrated surfer, Gusto mo maging surfer, maging world-class surfers, bumili ka ng property sa liwliwa, 
kaysa San Felipe Zambales uh, alam na bakit yung nabangit ko because I miss surfing okay? these were uh, so many years ago pa anyway at any rate um, pati kami rin may, medyo na scam kami doon na uh, we, we thought the waves there are, are high enough during the monsoon season may si habagat but it turns out hindi siya ganun ka surfable um, tayong wasak or uh, basag basag I think the term is basag basag yung mga waves doon so kaya sabi namin you know, uh, between Zambales and Baler Baler would would be would be a better surf spot but at any rate let's say someone bought a property in Zambales wanting to uh, to 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 become a a great surfer by surfing the waves of Liuliwa Zambales tapos turns out yun kung nalaman niya wala pa lang waves doon na ganun kaganda would he still buy the property ayan so depende pag sinabi niya na oo okay I will still buy it because what I'm buying is the property itself. Pero pag sinabi naman hindi ko uh, ano yan, hindi ko bibilhin yan. Now, th- then that motivation goes into okay, the essence or the substance of the contract. And if there was misrepresentation on the part of uh, the seller, then that can be a ground to annul the contract. But if there was no misrepresentation and the buyer could have easily verified or checked the um, the the surf in, in Liwiliwa Sambales then he could not use that as mistake or error or fraud committed by the other party kasi wala namang sinabi yung kabilang party or anyway, so yan so again, it's a case-to-case basis uh, and the court will have to uh, be the the authority on this question no? uh, because as a rule or the general rule is that once a contracting party signs or executes the contract then he is bound by it all these vices of consent are more of the exceptions rather than the general rule. So the burden is on the party using these as grounds to annul the contract to prove that they, in fact, comply with the requisites for these vices. Okay, now let's talk about violence. So what is violence? So uh, on your screen, you will find there the bold letters or the words in bold letters. So serious or irresistible force. So violence cannot be psychological violence, no. But rather it should be physical violence. So there must be serious or irresistible force employed to obtain consent. Like sinakal ka para pirmahan yung kontrata. Yan. So the requisites are the physical force employed must be irresistible or of such a degree that the victim has no other recourse under the circumstances but to submit and the force is the determining cause in giving the consent to the contract now also note that there is violence that vitiates the consent even if it is exerted by a third person now the law does not distinguish whether the third person is acting upon the direction of the other party or that the third person is acting independently Okay. and uh, he must have at least no an interest in the contract but he doesn't have to be the agent of the other party okay basta for as long as there is violence or a physical force that is irresistible in nature then that is violence that vitiates consent okay now intimidation is present when one of the contracting parties is compelled by a reasonable and well-grounded fear of an imminent and grave evil upon his person or property or upon the person or property of his spouse, descendants or ascendants forcing him to give his consent ito naman hindi siya physical but rather it's psychological okay? psychological, why? because it is the fear okay? the fear of an imminent and grave danger or evil that compels him okay, to sign the contract so the fear of uh, um, uh, pain or danger is not only against himself but also against his spouse, descendants, or ascendants. Okay, so this intimidation is like violence without the physical force. Okay, so what are the requisites? The intimidation must be the determining cause of the contract, or must have caused the consent to be given, and the threatened act must be unjust or unlawful. Third, the threat must be real and serious, there being an evident disproportion 
between the evil and the resistance which all men can offer, leading to the choice of the contract as the lesser evil. So in other words, in intimidation, there are two evils. The greater evil is the, uh, the threat to one's safety or uh, security. Okay? But the lesser evil is to sign the contract. So of course, you don't want let's say this contracting party doesn't want uh, to suffer the greater evil so kaya napilitan siya to take on the lesser evil which is to sign the contract now lastly it produces a reasonable and well-grounded fear from the fact that the person from whom it comes has the necessary means or ability to inflict the threatened injury thus if the intimidation is is uh, false or fake because the person allegedly making the threat is only bluffing or that he doesn't have the capacity to to uh, achieve his uh, evil design then walang intimidation okay but then if uh, the person creating this intimidation really has is in a position to to uh, to achieve the threat okay made then of course there is intimidation thus ginawa niya yun kaya siya pumirma so, if all these requisites are present, then there is intimidation that vitiates the consent. But note this exception: there is no intimidation when the other pro when the other party threatened only to sue and enforce his rights. Okay, so litigation, fear of litigation, is not intimidation. So, for example, there is no intimidation when the compromise agreement is entered into to avoid litigation. And by compromise agreement, kasama rito yung mga settlement out of court, ha? Hindi lang yung compromise agreement that is achieve, uh, approved by the court. So, halimbawa, nauso ngayon yung mga, um, har well, de, I have to make a distinction, na First, okay, may mga collectors, collecting agents, na mga banko at saka mga financial institutions who do it the right way. At meron din namang iba na who do it in the not so right way. Ibig ko sabihin yung nangaharas. Mamaya na tayo sa mga nangaharas. Okay, dito muna tayo sa diplomatic. Okay, doon sa diplomatic, um, they will send demand letters and then they will file actions like small claims. They will also file, let's say, a criminal case for estafa or BP-22 and then uh, also kung gumamit ka ng credit card, then uh, yung act involving uh, access devices yun, may criminal aspect kasi yun eh. so when they file that, then they inform uh, the debtor na we can actually settle this, if you agree here is a restructured loan, you sign this you are bound by this, and we will withdraw all the pending cases, so if that debtor signs that Later on, hindi niya pwedeng sabihin na kaya naman lang ako pumayag at pumirma do sa kontratang yon itong, re, uh, itong restructured loan is because I was intimidated to sign the restructured loan agreement because of the pending cases. So, sabi ng Supreme Court, that is not intimidation because when the creditor filed those cases, it, it was only enforcing its legal rights as a creditor. So, the intimidation must be uh, the threat of an act with, which is unjust or unlawful in the first place. So, filing of an action or the threat to file legal action, that is not an unfair, unjust, or unlawful act. Okay? Kasi meron iba kaya lang naman ako pumirma kasi nga sabi, pag hindi raw ako pumirma, papailan ako ng kaso at masi-sheriff daw ako. Well, you know, sometimes it pays to do some research or better yet, get yourself a lawyer to know your rights and obligations. Okay, pero doon naman tayo ngayon sa mga nakaharas. Yung mga nakaharas, of course, that is something else. Kasi when they harass, they 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 really intimidate uh, debtors uh, to do something against their will. no? So, for example, pag hindi ka nagbayad, we will send uh, letters to or we will tell your bosses, your management or we will uh, publish your uh, name and your face in newspapers or we will um, inform the entire say finance industry 
about your debts ganyan. so there is now a threat of um, disreputation meaning to say his reputation would be destroyed and there would also be a threat of um, libel so in that case pwedeng ma-intimidate siya doon into signing the contract because that would be unlawful okay so para siyang grave coercion na din kung tutuusin no? when you uh, threat something with a crime in order to collect a debt ayan so intimidation yan okay now let's talk about undue influence so ang violence speaks of physical force irresistible physical force intimidation speaks of uh, a well-grounded fear of an imminent and grave danger so from physical force to psychological fear ito naman moral ascendancy okay so what is undue influence it is present when a person takes improper advantage of his power over the will of another depriving the latter of a reasonable freedom of choice okay the position of the other party uh, is such that the other party cannot refute or cannot oppose the other kumbaga halimbawa a parent and a child or let's say a boss and an employee okay so there is undue influence when the other party takes advantage of that position of power okay, over the other now whether there is undue influence the following shall be considered now these are the factors to be considered because hindi naman kesyo ganun yung position ng dalawa automatic may undue influence na rin yun may undue influence na agad okay, so first is that the family, spiritual and other relations between the parties okay, so that's one and ayan, so kailangan and ha, hindi siya or so hindi siya alternative kailangan magkasama itong dalawa so there is a position of power and the other party must be vulnerable or weak with respect to the other so the fact that the person unduly influenced was suffering from mental weakness ignorance or financial distress that's why he was in a weak position and he could not counter or oppose the influence being exerted upon him so yun yung undue influence pero kung wala namang position of weakness kahit nandun yung position Ayan. So, uh, there's no undue influence Kasi nga, there is no undue influence When the person supposed to be influenced Is really a strong person, di ba? So, undue influence only Speaks of a situation where there is Well, because undue influence really is a question of power no? So, one is powerful and the other is powerless Ayan. Okay, next Wait lang Anong bago? Anong bago dito? Oh, by the way, been listening here since 5:30 p.m. Oh, hi, Mr. Octato. Hindi ka talaga ano no? Ah, hindi mo talaga ako iniwan. Char. <laughs> Ay, walang bibitaw, ah, wala bibitaw. Sa mga bibitaw okay lang. Ihi break. Hindi pwede niyo naman kasi i-on lang yung audio niyo. Huwag niyo na lang papatayin kasi sayang 'to. Eh, pero anyway, pag, pag gusto niyo panoorin ulit, of course, hopefully and uh, YouTube will not get this of my channel and dun lang naman siya panoorin niyo lang siya ulit i don't I, I will have to review no kung merong meron akong something na dapat i-gawin dito to make sure that i get to have it posted on my channel whether i have to review uh, download or something so yeah i have to check this again pero natutuwa ako dito sa sa live stream na ito because i'm i'm actually looking at uh uh, real time syempre may konting delay no? may konting delay siya um, so like a few seconds no? before I see my slides in the monitor pero it is still live nonetheless so instead of recording it separately and then uploading it on my channel pwedeng ganito na lang gawin natin no? sige I, I will consider that sa future videos natin yung alam walang editing dito so walang music <laughs> oh, yeah. okay so let's, not, let's now talk about fraud yeah. So what is fraud? Fraud is every kind of deception Whether in the form of insidious words Or machinations, manipulations, concealments Or misrepresentations For the purpose of leading The other party into error And thus execute a particular act So fraud is deception Fraud is panluloko yeah. Now if present It can either annul the contract Or make the obliger liable for damages so why the alternative remedies because there are two types of fraud 
you have, you have dolo causante and dolo incidente. So dolo causante determines or is the essential cause of the contract. Dolo causante is fraud employed at the time of the perfection of the contract. In other words, it uh, is a deception to cause the other party to agree to the contract. So in that case, the contract can be annulled. It is voidable. Okay, yan yung sasabi natin vice of consent fraud because consent is determined at the time of the perfection of the contract. Now, dolo incident on the other hand does not annul the contract because the fraud here is employed in the performance of the obligation. So there is now a valid and binding contract but in the performance of this uh, of his obligation the debtor or even the creditor committed fraud. So it could be uh, misrepresentation halimbawa ang debtor sabi ni, ni, ni debtor oh um, I cannot pay you for for this month or I, I can't pay you this month so uh, bigyan mo ako ng 2 months grace period kasi meron ako mabibentang property and I'm telling you okay, ang laki na makukuha kong, prop, makukuha kong pera doon na income doon so I'm going to pay you uh, 3 months in advance so bigyan mo ako ng grace period na 2 months so babayaran ko yung 2 months na yun plus 3 months in advance so that's a total of 5 months after 2 months from today yan so, siyempre si creditor siyempre napa, napapaniwala siya so that is fraud but in the performance of the obligation and that obligation is the payment so in that case the contract is not disturbed the contract is still binding but the aggrieved party the creditor can sue the debtor for damages aside from of course a specific performance so it will be an action well, of course, this is supposing na hindi nga niya natupad yung pangako niya na uh, 5 months kasi nga two, 2 months arrears at saka 3 months advance. So, pag hindi niya nagawa yun, then of course, the creditor can sue for specific performance and then ask for payment of damages because of the dolo incidente. Ayan. Okay. But uh, if it is fraud uh, or causal fraud or dolo, causante, the following requisites must be present. First, it must have been employed by one contracting party against the other. Second, it must have induced the other party to enter into the contract. Third, it must have been serious. And fourth, it must have resulted in damage or injury to the party seeking annulment. So, damage or injury here should be uh, pecuniary. No? So, for example, he has lost uh, money or property okay but uh, the mere um, uh, about agreement but without parting with money not yet that was kind of discovery of fraud then of course there is no damage yet no so he can decide to whether proceed or not to proceed kasi nga na discover na niya ngayon kung ano yung totoo okay so with that new knowledge the question now is will he still proceed Ayan. Kasi if he still wants to proceed, then okay na. Na-wave na ngayon yung fraud. Okay? Alright. Next, acts not considered fraudulent. So, we have the following provisions in the civil code. And uh, they provide, let's start with Article 1340. So, Article 1340 states that the usual exaggerations in trade when the other party had an opportunity to know the facts are not in themselves fraudulent. Article 1341 also states that a mere expression of an opinion does not signify fraud unless made by an expert and the other party has relied on the former special knowledge. Article 1342 also provides that misrepresentation by a third person does not vitiate consent unless such misrepresentation has created substantial mistake and the same is mutual. And Article 1343 states that misrepresentation made in good faith is not fraudulent but may constitute error. Okay, so at any rate, whether it's fraud or error, pwede pa rin yung ground to vitiate the consent, thus to annul the contract. No? Now, kung bakit ba sinabi pa ng civil code na it, it is not fraudulent but may constitute an error. So, ganun din, may ground pa rin to annul the contract. But at any rate, as sabi ng civil code, hindi po fraudulent yung mga yan. Well, una-una, dun sa usual exaggerations in trade. 
as a buyer, you must be a responsible and an intelligent buyer. You must know the difference between fact and fiction. Okay, so for example, meron ino-offer sa yung re sapatos at sabi ng nagbibete sa sapatos, sobrang tibay niyan sir, matapos na lang ang mundo, ayos pa rin yung sapatos na yan. It can outlive the world. Or, siguro, well, wala naman siguro nang sasabi na ngayon, pero lagi kong narinig yung mabubulok na lang ang paa mo, hindi pa rin mabubulok yung sapatos na yan. Okay, so of course that's an exaggeration, di ba? So, as a responsible and intelligent buyer, you should know the difference between fact and fiction. Now, also with respect to expert opinion naman, you must know, as a buyer, you must know if you're talking to an expert and that uh, his uh, opinion has an effect on your on your uh, decision to buy the property. So, mostly, uh, yung mga marketing skills na yan, they are not fraudulent. Okay? Because, again, the law also imposes on a would-be buyer or a uh, a prospective contractor or a, a, a prospective contracting party to the contract to do his research no? and not just uh, listen to and accept as fact uh, whatever is uh, communicated to him alright now let's talk about the object tapos sa tayo sa consent object naman tayo so the following are the requisites of a valid object so first it must be within the commerce of man so when is it within the commerce of man it is within the commerce of man if it is susceptible of alienation appropriation and private ownership so anong pumapasok sa isip nyo na mga outside the commerce of man so if you remember your law on property so yan yung mga res nullius uh, mga lands of the public domain Ayan, yung mga services, personal services that cannot be the subject of appropriation. Halimbawa, di ba? Uh, sexual services because that's prostitution. Okay, what else? Uh, sale of uh, body parts. Those are not uh, within the commerce of man. Okay. Now, it must also be licit or not contrary to law, morals, good customs, public policy, or public order. Now, a thing may be within the commerce of man but by legislative fiat or fiat uh, that cannot be uh, traded with or traded in so for example let's say um, a fish pond may be allowed uh, or used to be allowed uh, so you you buy uh, a property uh, and then convert it into a fish pond and then you sell it so pwede and then later on let's say a local ordinance is passed na hindi na po pwede okay, because of the threat to the environment or the threat to the local flora and fauna etc etc Ayan. so that becomes now illicit because it's it becomes contrary to law morals or public policy so there must be a specific law that makes this contract not or this thing or this object not uh, uh, subject to commerce okay now next is it must be possible so things are possible when they are within the commerce of man with respect to personal services, they are possible when they are within man's ordinary strength or power. Now, whether it is possible or not is determined at the time of the performance, okay? And not at the time of the execution of the contract. So, even though, let's say, do the execution of the contract, uh, ikaw, bodybuilder ka, okay, kaya mo magbuhat ng hollow blocks, ganyan bodybuilder magbubuhat na hollow blocks I don't think may connection dun no? because some bodybuilders just take steroids they are not necessarily strong okay so anyway well, a comment ko lang yan <laughs> that doesn't have to mean it's a fact okay. anyway so so yan bodybuilder nga tapos pitas ang ang, 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 ang ano is magkoconstruction ng bahay so ma, like ang sabi niya uh, in the contract he will finish the contract uh, to build the house like within one month okay but is that within uh, his ordinary strength or power maybe at the time of the execution of the contract the bodybuilder siya kaya niyang gawin niya within three months but then in the on the date of the execution let's say they agreed that the that the contract will be executed after six months Ayan. so on the date of the execution it becomes impossible so in that case the contract now loses an object or the object becomes void now because the object is impossible and lastly it must be determinate as to its kind so when is the object determinate well it is determinate when it is certain definite and described although it doesn't have to be 
specifically describe like hindi kailangan yung yung um serial number hindi kailangan yung weight hindi kailangan yung number the specific number no but at least it must be identified and segregated from its class okay so limbawa pag sinabi mong rice okay so it should be at least weighted so uh, weight or weighed weighted or weighed Ay, anyway kailan natimbang siya so kailan sabihin mo sa kontrata one sack of rice yeah pwede mo pwede sabihin na i am trading in a, or, or I am, I'd like to buy rice from you because the object there is indeterminate. Okay. So next about the cost. So the cost is the why of the contract, the reason for the parties to enter into the contract. So it's the um, partial motivation. It's the consideration, no? cost or consideration. Actually, they're the same. So what are the requisites of a valid cost? So first, it must exist. It must not be in the future, but it must exist at the time of the execution of the contract. Okay, next, it must be true. It, meaning to say, it must not be fake or it must not be fictitious or simulated. And lastly, it must be licit. In other words, the purpose or the reason for entering into the contract is not to do some wrong okay, or to commit some uh, illegality. Now, contracts without a cause or with an unlawful cause are void. But take note that although the cause is not stated, it is presumed that it exists and is lawful. Diba? How contradictory. <laughs> Ayan. So, ganyan talaga. Ganyan talaga civil code. Pero, ang ibig sabihin lang naman is that, you know, this becomes a rule on evidence lang eh. So, when the argument is that this contract is void because it doesn't have a cause, well, the presumption is that although it is not stated, the cause exists and it is lawful so the burden is now on the plaintiff to show that in fact there is no cause because contracts without a cause or with unlawful cause are void so hindi automatic na kung silent ang kontrata mo it is void okay? and I think that is a better rule than uh, for the defendant to show that there is a cause so maganda na lang na magkaroon tayo ng presumption as to the existence of a valid cause para at least he who has uh, who has uh, an interest to challenge the contract has the burden to prove that there was in fact no cause all right form of contracts <coughs> ay kamusta na kayo diyan tingnan natin ano meron dito mga greetings present po hindi po ako nakahabol sa meet kanina o nga Mr. Beltran Yeah, pati rin to si Mr. Malyari wala rin siya kanina but saka si Miss Olvido din good evening sir oh, sige iti-check ko nalang attendance niya later okay dun po sa mga hindi po uh, kasama do sa class sa UE College of Law Civil Law Review 2 ayan welcome po sa inyo um Karamihan po na ang dito na nanonood ay mga isudyante ko po. And because I believe that legal knowledge should be shared, I decided to do this uh, uh, YouTube uh, live para at least kahit hindi ko may isudyante makapanood naman dito. Ayan. Goods pa rin po, sir. Ayan. Goods. Yes. <coughs> uh, sir, ako na. <laughs> na boses na mamaos na ako. Okay. Imagine it's already 1 hour 33 minutes. Okay. <clears throat> okay, let's now talk about form of contracts. So contracts are valid in whatever form, whether verbal or in writing. So that's Article 1356. So when form is absolute and indispensable. Meaning to say, what are those grounds or instances when uh, the specific form should be complied with? Okay. Well, kung remedial law to or rules of court ito, taga sigurado talaga tayo. There is no doubt that the form is as essential as the substance. Okay, you have to follow or comply with the legal form otherwise the action can be dismissed. Okay, but in civil law, pagdating sa contracts, generally forms are just secondary. In fact, uh, you can have uh, different forms for the same contract because uh, the basic rule in contract law is that it is not what the parties call it to be but rather it is what the law treats it to be. So, kung sinabi ng mga parties na contract of sale ito with uh, right of repurchase but then since the property was given away not 
for the purpose of transferring ownership but rather for the purpose of securing a debt or a loan then the law says that is an equitable mortgage and not a sale o ba? Diba? so useless yung pag-execute nyo ng form and call it uh, this contract when in fact the law treats it differently okay but okay, let's say there is no doubt that this is a specific contract but then the question is is there a required form for, for the said contract well in the following instances the form is absolute and indispensable so the form must be complied with so first is when the form is essential for its validity at napag-usapan natin kanina but more on that here also when the form is essential for its enforceability okay now uh, kalma lang baka iisip nyo ngayon di ba pag enforceability hindi naman mandatory yun it's still mandatory it's just that meron lang siyang exceptions pero pagdating sa require pagdating sa, sa discussion or sa, sa point na the form is required for its validity that's really mandatory mandatory because if it's not complied with then the contract is void pero pagdating sa enforceability yes it is mandatory but then there are exceptions so kahit na hindi siya nag-comply sa uh, required form for purposes of enforceability but if the exceptions are present then the contract is now enforceable okay maya maya na yan dito muna tayo sa contracts that require a particular form for validity number one negotiable instruments like promissory notes checks and other bills of exchange so the negotiable instruments law provides for the contents and the things that must be found in the instrument so if the things of the or if these items or entries are not found then the negotiable instrument is void okay also na donations i cannot stress this enough okay donations uh, require specific form at ang pinaka importante doon yung acceptance talaga no so kaya may specific form now loans with interest ang required form dito is with respect to the interest so pero isama na natin yan. si pag nilagay ko yung interest din siya pero hindi niya magget so ang interest ang sabi ni sir so loans with interest so the loan can be valid even if it's verbal but If it is subject to an interest, the interest must be agreed upon in writing. Okay? So, kung wala yung writing na yun, yung written form for that interest, then the interest cannot be imposed. So, sabihin natin may utang, tapos uh, may interest na verbal. Okay? The creditor can just collect the principal loan but not the interest. Okay? Because imposition of interest without the uh, written agreement With respect to that interest is avoid uh, imposition okay next is agency to sell real property okay now um baka confused kayo nito pagdating doon sa enforceability ha kasi sa sabi dito sa civil code that an agency to sell real property is void if not in writing okay nasa law on ano yon nasa law on agency pero naging inconsistent yung rule na yon dito sa article uh, 1317 at saka 1403 because ang sabi ng article 1317 and 1403 if a person acted without the authority of the person who is principally liable the contract is unenforceable okay unless it is ratified So, in an agency to sell real property, it is still an agency. It's just that a specific form is required. So, but then, sabi nga nila, uh, sabi nga ng, 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 ng discussion na, na, natin na to, uh, the form is required for its validity. Okay? Validity for the uh, agency to sell between uh, the principal and the agent. But, sige, I, I will explain that later. Pagdating natin sa in, unenforceable contracts. Okay. Uh, next is contracts that must be in a public instrument so these are the contracts involving real rights over immovable property sale of real property or any interest therein session, repudiation or renunciation of hereditary rights or those of the um, conjugal partnership of gains or absolute community of property Ayan, power to administer property or power that may prejudice a third person and session of actions or rights proceeding from an act appearing in a public document so this must be stated or this must be contained in a public instrument okay but 
contracts that involve an amount exceeding 500 pesos, these contracts must be in writing even a private one. Okay. So, ito na ngayon ang malaking question. Okay. Itong Article 1358 na to, ito, is this a requirement for the validity of the contract or for an enforceability? Ito ang paliwanag dyan. The requirement as to form under Article 1358 Civil Code is not essential for the validity of the contract. It is also not for enforceability of the contract. Because when we speak of enforceability, then see Article 14.032 of the Civil Code, which is the Statute of Frauds. Okay? So clearly, this is only Article 1358 is only for convenience of the parties, so that meron na silang evidence of the contract, and that because there is a provision of law that states or that provides that they should be in a specific form, then one party may compel the other to execute the proper form of the contract. So, nabanggit natin kanina yung consensuality, di ba? So, execution of the contract or the proper form may also go into uh, the agreement. Okay? So, if the other party refuses to execute the uh, deed of sale, the written deed, the uh, public instrument, you know, say the notarized deed of sale, then the other party can demand it because that's part of the agreement. And why is it part of the agreement? Because the law goes into the agreement. So, Article, article 1358 is that basis. Ayan. For convenience lang siya. Hindi siya for validity, hindi rin siya for unenforceable, hindi siya for enforceability. But it is nonetheless demandable because we have uh, a specific provision for it. And that is Article 1358. O, balikan natin na. O, ipa-flash ko na ulit. Ano yung mga kontrata na dapat in a public instrument at ano din yung mga kontrata na dapat in writing even if it is a private written, uh, private writing. Okay. Okay. or a private document yan. private writing private document so yan, basta it exceeds 500 pesos then it should be in writing pero pag pinagawa mo sa abogado ang charge na abogado is 1,000 pesos at least or 1,500 o ano, papasulat papagawa mo pa ba sa abogado well the law naman doesn't require that it should be in a legal document it only says a private document ayan, so Uh, that's why uh, it is uh, enough the, that the uh, contract is written in a piece of paper, a notebook, etc. Pwede na yun. Okay. Alright. Now, let's go to reformation of instruments. Woohoo! Kalahati na. Okay. The total slides, 61. Okay. Nasa 34 na tayo. At high po sa mga 53 na viewers natin ngayon. Ayan. Actually, hindi lang lumalabas sa counter ko na may tatlong zeros pa dito. So, that's 53,000 viewers. Ay, nag-52 na tuloy. Ayan, sorry po doon sa umalis if you're not happy. Ayan. But I'm doing my best here. So, <laughs> ayan. Okay, nagpapatawalan tayo. Uh, my failed attempt at, at, you know, at be uh, comedic. Okay, anyway. So, reformation of instruments. So, what is reformation of instruments? It is the correction of an instrument to express the real intention of the parties. That's why it says reform, to correct. Okay? But we correct or we reform the instrument, not the contract. Because the contract is already binding between the parties. Okay? But reformation is proper when the following requisites are present. First, there must have been a meeting of the minds upon the contract. And the instrument or document evidencing the contract does not express the true agreement between the parties. And lastly, the failure of the instrument to express the agreement must be due to mistake, fraud, inequitable conduct, or accident. Ayan. So, these are the requisites before reformation of instruments can be had. Now, a bit of procedure. Ano kayang action if a file mo? Specific performance. Recession? Ano kaya? Ejectment? <laughs> yeah, of course, ginugulo ko lang kayo. Now, uh, the action for reformation of instruments is the same remedy for declaratory relief. Ayan. So, hanapin nyo na lang sa rules of court ninyo. Yun ang ipafile nyo if you want to reform an uh, instrument. Also, the same din yung declaratory relief, uh, removal of cloud, at saka ito, reformation of instruments. So, it should be filed before the regional trial court. Ayan. 
Okay, next. When reformation is not proper, okay? So, we have uh, three uh, types of contracts which cannot be reformed. So, first, simple donations inter vivos wherein no condition is imposed. Okay? Second, wills. And third, when the real agreement is void. The reason for the first two is that they are essentially gratuitous and the court cannot interfere with the wishes of the grantor. Yeah. And uh, for the third uh, case, which is the real when the real agreement is void, the reason why reformation is not proper is because the court cannot correct a void contract. Okay, Because reformation is only proper when the defect is in the expression of the intent of the parties but not uh, the absence or the uh, nullity of the contract. No? It cannot con correct or it cannot make valid a void contract. <clears throat> Alright, let's now talk about interpretation of contracts. So the general rule is that if the terms of a contract are clear and leave no doubt upon the intention of the contracting parties, the literal meaning of its stipulation shall control. Okay, so read the contract as it is. The contract is the contract. Okay. Now, also take note of the parole evidence rule which states that where the parties have reduced their contract into writing, the contents of the writing constitutes the sole repository of the terms of the agreement between the parties. Thus, extem uh, extemporaneous, extraneous evidence cannot be admitted like uh, bawa, a text message or uh, an oral declaration hindi pwede admit yun because the effect would be to modify what was already reduced into writing. If the parties intended it to be in writing, then it becomes the sole repository repository of the terms of the agreement between the parties. Okay, but then nobody's perfect. Even these contracts are not perfect. So in case of doubt, what are the rules of interpretation? So the first rule is the plain meaning rule. So it states that when the terms of the agreement are so clear and explicit that they do not justify an attempt to read into it any alleged intention of the parties, the terms are to be understood literally just as they appear on the face of the contract. Okay, so when you read a contract, huwag niyo masyadong pahirapan ang sarili niyo. You just read it as it is. Okay, do not try to give it a different meaning. Okay, whatever impression it gives you after reading the contract, that is the literal meaning. Apply it as it is. Okay. Now, in case of doubt, okay, in the words or in the phraseology of the contract, then we follow the second rule, which is the supremacy of intent of the parties. So, where there is ambiguity in the writing, the true agreement and the intention of the parties must be pursued. And to give effect to this intention, reformation of instrument is proper. Okay, next, contract must be taken as a whole. Where there are several provisions or particulars, the construction that will give effect to all shall be adopted. We do not follow the separability of laws or bills. No, In laws and bills, uh, if one provision is declared unconstitutional, then the rest of uh, the uh, provisions of the law shall remain undisturbed and shall be given effect. But in a contract, as much as possible, take one, take all. Okay? All or nothing yan. So, lahat, uh, the entire contract must be taken as a whole. Next, usages or customs. The usage or custom of the play shall be borne in mind in the interpretation of the ambiguities of a contract and shall fill the omission of stipulations which are ordinarily established. Now, this is very common uh, in cases of compensation for personal service or even rents for um, uh, houses or properties in different localities. So, the parties may omit the specific price or the specific amount but it doesn't mean they did not agree on the consideration it's just that they they open uh, the or they subject the fixing of the amount to usages and customs or they open the possibility that these uh, amounts can be modified according to usages or customs yeah okay now next is interpretation against the party who caused the obscurity so the rule is that the obscurity or 
ambiguity shall be strictly construed against the party who draws up the contract. And this finds greatest application in contracts of adhesion. So a contract of adhesion is a contract that is ready made or prepared by one party for the other party to accept or to reject. Now, contracts of adhesion are not necessarily void just because they are one-sided. Okay? Of course, they are one-sided because they are prepared by just one side but if the other party has the opportunity to review it and uh, he can still reject it if he decides to accept it and proceed with the contract that means he agrees to the terms and conditions of the contract so walang problema now note that just because the contract is a contract of adhesion and uh, was ready made it doesn't me uh, waive okay it doesn't waive the right of the debtor okay to uh, remedies under under the law. So, for example, pag merong vitiation of consent, that can still be raised, notwithstanding the fact that the contract is ready-made. So, alimbawa, may mga terms doon na hindi niya maintindihan or may mga terms doon na ang belief niya is ganito, yung pala iba, pala ibig sabihin. So, alimbawa, nakalagay doon na uh, ano ba mga contracts of addition? Alimbawa, uh, insurance contracts. Diba? So, insurance contracts. Okay. Hmm. Uh, smoking, ayan. Say smoking. So, ang question doon is, uh, how long have you been smoking or how how often? How long? O oh, sige. Well, pag sayo mong how long, I think there's only one interpretation for that, which means, gaano ka nakatagal na giyosi? Okay? So, how about how often uh, have you been smoking? Or how often do you smoke? So, ang sagot niya, often. Or not so often. Okay? So, uh, or how frequent pala, how frequent. When the insurer wanted the insured to state there the number of sticks per day, you cannot blame the insured applicant or the applicant for that insurance policy to state there the, the adjective, which is, pag sinabi niyang, uh, just right, or parang ganyan, or just so often, parang ganyan, or occasionally, mga ganyan. Because the word the question itself na how often or how frequent okay, have, uh, are you smoking, ambiguous siya. It doesn't suggest the answer. But if the question was clear enough, like how many sticks in a day do you smoke, then at least masasagot ng tama yun, no? insured. But here, in case that insured will be disqualified for maybe concealment or misrepresentation, na ba yung beneficiary niya hindi makakakuha ng proceeds of the insurance because allegedly there was concealment or misrepresentation in the application for the policy then uh, if I were the judge I will resolve it against the insurer why? because the question itself is ambiguous so if the question is ambiguous and since this was prepared by the insurance company then resolve that ambiguity against the insurance company Ayan. so that's uh the rule on interpretation against the party who caused the obscurity. Kaya pagka ganun, if you are drafting the contract, pag later on, ba, na-hire kayo ng, ano, ng isang company to prepare, let's say, a code of discipline, or let's say, mga ganyan, no? mga insurance contracts, try to be more specific rather than uh, use general words. Like, tulad yan, how frequent. Yes, it's okay, frequent is a general term, but you, you can be you're more specific by asking how many sticks of cigarette do you smoke in a day? Yan. Okay. Alright. Now, last uh, rule on interpretation of contracts is least transmission of rights and uh, greatest reciprocity of interests. So, when there is ambiguity and the contract is gratuitous, the least transmission of rights and interests shall prevail. But if the contract is only rules, the doubt shall be settled in favor of the greatest reciprocity of interests. Okay, ito hindi na natin masyado to pinapansin, no? Pero tinan nyo, ha? Uh, why, why, why the distinction is very, very important. If the contract is gratuitous, you apply the rule on, or the, the, the rule of, in, the presumption in favor of least, in, least transmission of rights. Okay? Gratuitous, so least transmission of rights. Pag onerous, greatest reciprocity of interest. So, examples of gratuitous contracts are um, <coughs> donations, uh, comodatum, okay? 
Yeah. Basta yung mga walang walang compensation, mga walang bayad, eh, hindi nagbabayad, tapos the other party just uh, is in the receiving end of the liberality of the other party. What else? Waivers. Okay? Waivers. Uh, condonation. Remission of debt. Yan. So, lahat yan gratuitous yan. So, if there is a doubt whether okay, the comodatum is a contract of lease, whether it's comodatum or contract of lease, resolve it in favor of comodatum. Okay? Why? Because lease transmission of rights. Okay? <clears throat> so, ibig sabihin, ang bucket list transmission of rights because in comodatum uh, the the right of the ba the bailey or the borrower is subject to pre-termination bakit when the bailor the, because the comodatum may be a precarium if you remember what a precarium is in a precarium the bailor can demand the return of the thing anytime okay so at will a precarium is a comodatum at will so ibig sabihin mas uh, least and tra less uh, least transmission of rights in comodatum than uh, lease because in a contract of lease the lessor okay subjects the the property to uh, the right of the lessee to possess it for a very specific and definite time hindi niya pwedeng i-demand ang hindi niya pwedeng i-demand ang return just about any time okay so comodatum versus less lease Aside from the fact na sa lease kasi merong compensation Pero sa komodatum kasi If it's the, the basis is only gratuity Then lease transmission of rights Then choose komodatum Okay, if there is a doubt Whether the contract is donation or sale Again, you have a gratuitous contract So lease transmission of rights Okay, ang tanong donation ba or, or uh, sale Dito ngayon nagkaka- Parang, parang malabo because both of them result in the transfer of property so it doesn't really matter whether it's donation or sale kasi nga wala namang uh, one is uh, whether lease transmission or the other one is of greater transmission right Pare parehas lang yan but okay if alimbawa ang doubt is between donation as well as komodatum okay o, di piliin mo yung komodatum because between komodatum and donation walang transfer of ownership dito sa komodatum so pinapahiram lang niya sa'yo pero hindi niya binibigay sa'yo yan yes, gratuitous yung paggamit mo pero it doesn't mean you become the owner o, diba? so ganun yung pagka-gratuitous pagka-gratuitous as much as possible avoid transfer of ownership or avoid a burden uh, uh, av avoid an unnecessary burden on the grantor okay, but if it is onerous naman in other words, where uh, both parties uh, suffer a burden, then the presumption is in favor of the greatest reciprocity of interest. So, ito na tayo ngayon. Pag nag nagbanggaan ang donation at saka a contract of sale, the sale, the contract of sale is preferred because in a contract of sale, there is greatest reciprocity of interest. Why? Because in a uh, contract of sale both parties now perform or impose a burden on one another or, or on themselves sa part ng seller of course there's a transfer or deliver transfer of ownership and delivery of the property but at least the other party also imposes upon himself the burden to pay the price in a donation wala okay yung isa syempre he will uh, transfer the property but the donee doesn't pay anything or he only accepts it so if the conflict is between um, sale or donation and the contract is supposed to be onerous then choose okay, the uh, contract that involves greatest reciprocity of interest okay so anyway yan. okay now let's talk about defective contracts yes ano tayo? Uh, this class is only good for 2 hours ah sorry 3 hours ba to? Yeah, we, we usually start at 5.30 and end at 8.30, so 3 hours. Okay, so 1 hour 59 minutes. Okay, not bad. I still have 20 slides. <clears throat> okay, kalain nyo yun. Uh, contracts. Okay, let's proceed. So what is, uh, wait lang, wait lang. Makatingin nga tayo sa mga comments dyan. Comments. Sayo po, di nakabo sa meet kanina. Oo nga, lagi ka na lang late. Lagi ka na lang late, ano, Mr. Rosario. 
Ayan, si Mr. Serade is watching from Butuan. Lagi ka lang nasa Butuan. Ayan, hi from Naga City, Camarines Sur. Hello po, Miss uh, Lerma Castillo. Ayan. Hi, Mr. Ramos, kamusta? Ayan. Um, so, I hope everyone is uh, learning something today. Ayan. Sige, papahingin ko muna. Hello muna ko. <laughs> Ayan. Okay. Because I'm having fun with this, ano, uh, with this live. Ito lang pala gawin natin kaysa mag-record ako. Pwede na mag-record yun na nga because syempre nakaka-edit tayo ganyan. So, we can also add music. Pero siguro next time I'll try to play something let's say relaxing music like spa music. Okay ba spa music? Or baka na makatulog kayo. Or maybe sa mga lighting-lighting mga kandila ng ganyan. Para spa music talaga. Ganyan. Spa spa environment. No. Um, syempre, well, we, we are here not so much about the aesthetics and the visuals but rather we are here for what you are hearing no, and seeing on the screen. So, yan. So, makinig na lang kayo muna. Ayan. Alright, let's proceed. So, defective contracts. What are the four defective contracts? We have void and inexistent contracts, voidable contracts, resistible contracts, and unenforceable contracts. Ayan. So, let's begin with Ano unahin natin? Siyempre, kung ano yung kasunod sa slides? Siyempre, it's resistible contracts. So, what are resistible contracts? So, first, what is rescission? Rescission is the remedy for the restoration of things to their condition at the moment prior to celebration of the contract. That's why re rescission is also called restitution. So, what are the requisites for rescissible contracts okay not rescission under article 1191 okay bakit may rescission under article 1191 well actually yun talaga dapat yung un yung una una po pasok sa utak niyo when you say rescission rescission under article 1191 so this is more of a you know a, a, a special class of contracts that are rescinded Okay, for a different cause. Pero pag sinayang mong rescission, it's a counterpart remedy for specific performance. So, rescission is inherent in reciprocal obligations. Diba? Yan ang sabi ng Article 1191. So, it follows that there is a binding contract but one party fails to perform his obligation. So, the remedy is either specific performance or rescission. So, that's the general understanding of rescission. But here, we are looking at contracts that are rescissible for specific grounds or reasons. So, what are the requisites for rescissible contracts? Number one, the contract must be a rescissible one such as those mentioned in Articles 1381 and 1382 of the Civil Code. Second, the party asking for rescission must have no other legal means to obtain reparation for the damages suffered by him. Actually, parehas lang to doon sa rescission under Article 1191. Rescission as a remedy is subsidiary. The principal remedy is still to allow the other party to perform his obligation or to allow, in the case of resistible contracts, to allow the other party to either rectify or to uh, amend uh, the, the contract and uh, proceed with the contract. Ayan, so, ayan. so, meron lang po tayong kotse na sira ang fan belt na dumaan <laughs> ayan, sa labas. Okay, um, Alright, next, the person demanding rescission must be able to return whatever he may be obliged to restore if rescission is granted. So, yan. Remember Article 1169 on delay or default? So, sabi ng Supreme Court, or sabi ng Civil Code, there is no delay or default when, okay, na, when the party demanding the performance of the obligation of the other party is himself not ready to perform his own obligation. So, he cannot you know, uh, uh, demand or call the other part, call out the other party for his delay kasi siya nga mismo hindi siya ready to perform his own obligation. So, there is delay in a given case only when one party is already ready or has in fact performed this obligation. Similarly, in rescission of contracts, the person demanding rescission must also be able to return what he has received. So, kung hindi na niya maibabalik yung kanyang natanggap, then he cannot demand rescission from the other party. Ayan. So, well, basically, you know, yung principle natin come to court in cle with clean hands also goes into this. Ayan. 
Alright, next uh, requisite is that the things which are the object of the contract must not have passed legally to the possession of a third person acting in good faith. The action for rescission must be brought within the prescriptive period of four years. Let me just state that itong, itong, uh, pag ilan to? One, two, three, fourth requisite. Itong sabing the things which are the object of the contract must not have passed uh, to an innocent purchaser for value is in fact a defense to an action poliana. Okay? So, what is an action poliana? Well, it's an action filed to rescind a contract that was entered into in fraud of a creditor. So, the creditor can sue uh, the debtor and the third person. Okay? In order to rescind that contract, return to the uh, debtor what has been transferred to the third person so that that property will be placed within the reach of the creditor okay, as payment for the unpaid obligation. But that applies only if the third person is not in good faith. So, kung in bad faith siya, so equally guilty siya with the debtor. So, kaya pwedeng irisin. But if that third person was an innocent purchaser for value or a buyer in good faith, then he can be, uh, then uh, that action poliana cannot prosper. Okay? Alright. So, I mentioned earlier 11, rescission under Article 1191. And uh, now, let's look at the difference between rescission under Article 1191 and rescissible contracts under Article 1381. So first, Article 1191 applies to reciprocal obligations where one party fails to comply with his obligations under the contract. Now, substantial breach is required. So a simple breach like non-payment of just one installment is not a valid ground for rescission. It should be substantial. Now, what is substantial will have to depend on the main obligation and the uh, uh, total number of breach, if ever. So, kung utang is 1 million, ang hindi nabayaran is only 1,000. That's not a substantial breach. But let's say the balance is uh, 800,000 pesos against a principal obligation of 1 million. So clearly, that's a very substantial breach because that's uh, a balance of 80% of the main obligation. Alright, next. Article 1381 applies to contracts where there is lesion, economic disadvantage, and fraud committed against creditors. Lastly, Article 1191 can only be asserted by a party to the contract. Article 1381 can be asserted even by a third person, for example, action poliana in a violation of a right of first refusal. Okay, so nabagit ko na kanina yung action poliana, no? Alright. Okay, now, let's look at the rescissible contracts under Article 1381 and 1382 of the Civil Code. First, those which are entered into by guardians whenever the wards whom they represent suffer a lesion by more than one-fourth of the value of the things which are the object thereof. Okay? So, lesion is para kang nalugi. Okay? Um, so, it's it's a uh, it's being shortchanged. No? And the amount or the uh, the lesion should be one-fourth of the value of the things. So, let's say the value of the thing is 100,000 and one-fourth of that or 25% of that would be 25,000. Okay, pero before ko magbigay ng example, ah, diretso muna tayo dito sa <coughs> uh, second. Ito, those agreed upon in representation of absentees if the, la the latter suffered the lesion stated in the preceding number. So, only in two instances can you use uh, lesion. Okay, and uh, you will notice that the real victim there is uh, someone who is either absent or is not in a position to bargain okay like for example a minor so let's say a minor purchased okay bumili siya right bumili siya ng let's say uh, a book okay o si kahit ano basta worth 100,000 para mas madali ang computation okay let's say uh, it's it's a it's a toy worth 100,000 pesos now the value is 100,000 pesos but it was sold to that child for 125,000 pesos. So there is an overprice by 25,000. And 25,000 against 100,000 that's one fourth of the actual value. Okay? Now consider naman a different situation. 
let's say dun sa pangalawa an absentee uh, if you watched my uh, video on uh, law and persons personality uh, persons personality uh, okay pasensya na buti hindi nyo naamoy hindi ako uh, okay I haven't had my, my 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 dinner yet so okay lang yan um, kasi syempre diba, food is life but work is lifer Okay, so going back, so in my uh, video on person, personality, uh, use of surnames and absent, absence, a person who has been absent by leaving the domicile and uh, his whereabouts are being are, are unknown, a representative may be appointed if he has been absent for two years and that representative has the power to administer the property. But the real party pa rin dun ha is yung absent your absentee the representative is just an extension or an alter ego of the absentee so whatever he does or whatever he suffers it will be for the account of the absentee so kaya dito papasok yan yung lesion na yan so let's say the representative of that absentee had to sell a property because uh, there is a need to let's say pay or to provide uh, support, financial support to the children of this absentee. So, he gets the approval, this representative or administrator gets the approval from the court, so the court approves the sale. Sabi, okay, go ahead, you can sell the property of the absentee. Now, nabenta niya yung property which is 100,000 pesos, but only for 75,000 pesos. So, meron namang underpriced. Okay, yung isang situation kayo na overpriced na lugi yung sabi, ya, tama, na lugi yung bata because he had to pay more by at least 25% or one fourth of the real value of the thing and also this one the absentee through his representative suffered a lesion of one fourth by uh, having to sell a property for less than its actual value and the lesion is 25% or one fourth so, yung mga situations na ganyan, pwedeng i-resend yung kontrata na yan. Okay, because one, ang reason is that yung isa, is na, yung minor is not in a position to bargain, to intelligently bargain. And the other one is that because the, because he was absent. Okay, now next, those undertaken in front of creditors when the latter cannot in any other manner collect the claims due them. Action Puliana. Alright, next, those which refer to things under litigation if they have been entered into by the defendant without the knowledge and approval of the litigants or of competent judicial authority. So, let's say the property is under litigation and that property is sold okay, by the defendant prior to the termination of the case. So, that sale to a third person can be rescinded okay, under Article 1381. Pero here's an interesting question. Is it required that a notice of lease pendants should have been annotated on the title of that property before it before the sale of that property can be rescinded under Article 1381? Mm. Kasi sabi dito, under litigation. So, should there be a notice of lease pendants? Okay? So that the third person will know that this is under litigation? And the answer is no. Okay? Why? Because this provision is or creates a right in favor of the creditor. Okay, the notice of lease pendants is a notice to the third person. So, that notice of lease pendants, if not made, will only affect a third person, but it doesn't change the fact that the parties to the case are aware that the thing is under litigation. So, kahit na hindi humingi ng notice of lease pendants si plaintiff slash creditor, hindi mawawala yung right niya to sue. Uh, or to file an action poliana okay because both him as the creditor and the defendant are aware that this property is under litigation and yet this defendant sells the property to a third person okay so next payments made in a state of insolvency for obligations to whose fulfillment the debtor could not be compelled at the time they were effected okay so in your insolvency law you will know that uh, the properties of the um, insolvent person are under what we call conservatorship or receivership okay well depending on kung anong patas gagamitin nila and also if it's a natural person or a juridical person at saka kung juridical person yan ano ba yung banko ba yan o ano diba so pero parehas lang ang concept niyan an insolvent debtor cannot sell his properties which are under or which have been submitted to the court okay without the approval of the court okay so 
kapag ka binenta niya yan okay um Okay, pagka binenta niyan, of course there is an action to uh, to rescind the contract. Now also, payments made. Okay, halimbawa may utang, okay, may utang si insolvent creditor, uh, insolvent debtor sa ibang mga creditors. Huwag niyang hindi pwedeng bayaran 'yon without the approval of the court because even his payments must be approved by the court because every money, every property that an insolvent person has must be held in trust for the benefit of all the creditors. Walang dapat nauuna sa iba. And that is why there is a payment plan or a payment schedule, okay, that uh, the court will approve so that all uh, the creditors can 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 concur uh, in the uh, uh, in the properties or whatever remains of the properties and assets including funds of the debtor okay so all other contracts declared by law to be subject to rescission yeah so check nyo na lang yung iba mabatas dyan all right next voidable contracts okay oh, yeah, hey. ilang contracts na lang tatlo na lang watching from butuan <coughs> june serada Okay, hi June Ayan, Biyahe ka lang ng biyahe Ingat Okay, next, voidable contracts So what are voidable contracts? Voidable contracts, they are existent Valid and binding Although they can be annulled because of Want of capacity Or vitiated consent of one of the parties Okay So, notice that it speaks of Capacity and consent But never about object and cause. Okay, tandaan niya na pag avoidable contracts, consent lang at sa capacity ang pag-uusapan natin. Pag avoid contracts naman, all three are are open for business. In other words, capacity, object and cause. Pero pag avoidable contracts lang, consent lang or capacity ang affected. Okay? The object and the cause should be valid. Okay? Because kapag ka-invalid ng object at saka cost, ipasok mo na sa void contracts. Alright, so, voidable contracts are valid until annulled or set aside. But they are subject or they can be confirmed or ratified. Now, speaking of ratification, ratification requires a prior knowledge that the contract is defective. And defied, de, defied, despite the defect okay, in the contract, The person who has the right to seek the annulment of the contract accepts the benefit of the contract or proceeds to perform the contract. So that's why meron ng ratification and ratification now waives the right to annul the contract. Hindi niya pwede sabihin, okay, ra-ratify ko ngayon pero siguro pag nagbago isip ko, I will sue for annulment. Hindi pwede. Once ratification is made, the defect is cured. All right, grounds. <clears throat> Article 1390 provides that the following are voidable contracts one those where one of the parties is incapable of giving consent to a contract okay in one party is incapable of giving consent to the contract ibig sabihin one party is a minor okay or an insane or imbecile ganyan so again panoorin niyo lang yung lecture video ko on the law on persons para maintindihan niyo yung mga capacity at saka yung mga circumstances that affect the capacity of a person so sabihin natin minor gamitin natin example ng minor now Arturo Tolentino states that uh, minority should be a ground for absolute nullity of the contract it cannot be relative in capacity but then the code Uh, the, the, the drafters or the code commission decided to put this under voidable contracts now of course uh, dapat duralex said lex huwag na natin pag-usapan to no? but let's let's try to understand why a, a contract entered into by a minor is just voidable and not void okay the reason is simple a minor may have the chance to ratify the contract Why? Because he can attain majority. So in other words, if he entered into the contract at age of minority, but let's say three years later he becomes uh, an adult and he acquires uh, legal capacity, he can ratify that. And if he ratifies that, then the defect is cured. What is more is that if the sale is for the benefit of the minor, or sorry, if the contract, nasanay lang ako sa sale okay? so if the contract is for the benefit of the minor 
such as when it is for the support, sustenance, education of that minor, then it is valid because that is for the best interest of the child. Okay, so why consider it void when it was in fact entered into for the benefit of the child? So here the ratification can be made by the parent or the guardian. So kaya, uh, the code commission was correct na isama to dito sa voidable contracts because there is a a what a, a, a positive purpose or a positive uh, reason for for just putting it under voidable contracts and that is it can be ratified or it should be held valid until it is annulled okay so ayan malinaw na yan ha ayan. pero anyway basahin niyo na lang yung kanyang ano diyan kanyang um, argument pero kasi argument niya kasi is that based on the other codes like the Argentinian code mabiyan yung mahilig siya mag-cite ng mga codes ng ibang bansa ayan so well, of course i'm not saying that they are irrelevant because our civil code after all follows a um a, this large world system of civil law so kaya dapat meron silang interrelation or consistency because we are a civil law country so we pattern our laws from uh, these civil law jurisdictions kaya tinitingnan niya bakit meron doon sa atin wala well ultimately our legislators had uh, decided to you know to 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 go against the grain and and consider this circumstance merely as a ground for voidable contracts okay eh, hindi naman tatanong sa bar yan pero malay natin di ba knowing justice lonen uh, baka may pina-explain pa sa inyo why bakit civil code bakit hindi kodigo civil <laughs> okay, next. Those where the consent is vitiated by mistake, violence, or okay, okay, pick it. Pick it tayo. Memorize ulit natin. So, what are these vices of consent? Mistake, violence, intimidation, undue influence, and fraud. Oh, diba? Yeah, tandaan. Tandaan talaga yan. Limang yan. Okay, now, annulment of contract. Okay, by the way, tinan titinan yung grounds. Ha? Dalawa na talagang grounds for voidable contracts. And they go into the consent or capacity of the parties. Okay, so let's now talk the procedural aspect of the annulment of the contract. So first, it must be brought within four years. Okay, but when? Okay, so kaya ito sabi ko, pagka mistake and fraud, the four years shall be counted from the time of the discovery of the fact the fact that was concealed in case of fraud or the true fact in case of mistake or error now if the ground is violence intimidation or undue influence then the four year period shall be counted from the cessation of the violence undue influence or intimidation so yan so kaya magkaiba kung kailan magsisimula yung four year prescriptive period next because it's an equitable remedy, the party who can file the action to annul the contract is the victim. Hindi pwede yung offending party. So it may be brought only by the victim and not the party responsible for the defect. Now, this is very interesting. If the ground is incapacity, halimbawa, um, the minor uh, files an action to annul the contract because of his incapacity, then of course the action will prosper kasi siya naman talaga yung victim but what if okay that incapacitated person misrepresented himself as an adult and induced the other party to believe that he is an adult and for which reason this adult entered into a contract with this incapacitated person so in this case the party the incapacitated person cannot take advantage of that to escape from the consequences of the contract which he sought out himself ibig sabihin you cannot uh, let uh, kumaga, yung, yung, yung saying natin na you cannot have your cake and eat it too ikaw na nga yung minor nagpanggap ka na adult ka bumili ka alak kaya si nakabili ka na alak tapos hindi mo mabayaran ngayon so iaanal mo ngayon yung contract because of your incapacity but you look like you're an adult Okay, you act like an adult and so the other party was induced okay, to believe that you are in fact capacitated to enter into the contract so in this case you are the guilty party even though you are incapacitated so you could use other grounds uh, for annulling the contract like mistake violence, intimidation, undue influence and fraud but not your incapacity okay so come to court with clean hands
All right, now, next, like rescission, the effect of annulment is mutual restitution. The exception is that when the principle against unjust enrichment applies. So, you cannot demand the return of the thing if, for example, if the thing to, is to be returned, uh, like, for example, no, a contract of lease. Okay, so, it's a contract of lease of a property and let's say the plaintiff or the victim was allowed to remain in the premises. Okay, and then... Um, he paid rent. Okay, so nagbayad siya ng rent. And for some reason, let's say, uh, mistake, okay, mistake or fraud. So, the contract was annulled. Ngayon, restitution is required as a consequence of annulment, di ba? Now, will you require the lessor to return the lease or the rentals considering that the lessee was already in po had been in possession of the property? Well, that will result in unjust enrichment. Kasi ang mangyari, he would the lessee would have stayed in the lease premises for free. Okay? So, hindi na ibabalik sa kanya yung rent kasi nga, after all, na-occupy naman niya yung lease premises. Alright. Okay, let's now talk about unenforceable contracts. <clears throat> unenforceable contracts. An unenforceable contract is one which cannot be enforced or does not produce legal effect unless it is first ratified in the manner provided by law. Doon pa lang sa statement na yon ang tanong mo agad, is it valid until unenforced? <laughs> diba? Kasi, pag resistible contract, valid until rescinded. Voidable contract, valid until annulled. E ba paano pag unenforceable contract, is it valid until unenforced? Well, unenforceable contracts are no contracts at all unless it is ratified. But it may have all the requisites. It may have all the elements. So that's what makes it different from void contracts kasi pag void contracts walang elements yun eh. Or may problema sa elements. Dito, the elements are present. There are no defects. It's just that it's not executed in accordance with the law with the manner provided by the law that's why it cannot be enforced so it is valid but cannot be enforced hmm. okay because pag sila mo void yan eh, hindi siya unenforceable void contract siya okay so kung kailangan nyo na isang sentence okay it's an enforceable contract it's a valid contract but cannot be enforced now the term statute of frauds is descriptive of statutes which require certain classes of contracts to be in writing if the contract is not in writing, it is unenforceable. Okay, more of the statute of frauds in a bit. So, let's now look at the uh, unenforceable contracts under Article 1403. Okay, so again, balik tayo do sa form of contracts ha. Ang mga laging tatandaan natin ay Article 1358, okay, 1403. Okay, at saka other special laws that require or special or specific provisions in the civil code that require a specific form for the validity of the contract. Okay, now we're talking about uh, re re requirements for the enforcement of the contract. Okay, ulitin natin, forms or the form of the contract can be relevant only for three reasons. If it's for the validity, it's for the enforceability, or for the convenience of the parties. Okay, now let's look at unenforceable contracts under Article 1403. And these are... Those entered into in the name of another by one without or acting in excess of authority. So, for example, an agent acting for and on behalf of a principal. So, yan. Uh, it is unenforceable if that agent has no authority or even if he had authority but this act was not within his authority or even if he had authority over this transaction but he exceeded his, his authority. Like, for example, he was told to collect cash but he collected payment by credit. Okay? So, yun. That would be exceeding his authority. So, the contract entered into by that agent is unenforceable against the principal. Next, where, though, where both parties are incapable of giving consent. Ayan. So, hindi ko na kala ulit ulitin to ha. The reason is that even though both are incapable of consent, they are capable of ratifying the contract. Okay? So, for purposes of classification, pag-iisa lang ang incapable, voidable. Because after all, it's valid 
upon or against the other party who is capable. But if both of them are incapable of giving consent, then it's unenforceable. There is a contract, but it cannot be enforced because they are, I sorry, because they are incapable of giving consent. So, papano, papano ngayon makukure at para ma-enforce yung contract pagka both are incapable. E di hintayin na magiging capable sila, in other words, when they reach majority age or through their parents or guardians. Yan. So again, wag natin i-totally avoid ang contract entered into by a minor. Yan ang sabi ng code commission, hindi ako nagsabi niyan. Okay, next, those which do not comply with the statute of frauds. And this is where we we uh, we find um, the more interesting stuff. Kita ka dito kayo makakarap ng maraming questions sa bar. Ano ba ito statute of frauds? Ano ba yung mga kontrata na dapat uh, in writing so that they can be... Um, uh, enforced because as far as itong dalawang to under article 1403 itong uh, those entered into in the name of another by one without or acting in excess of authority or those entered into by when the two parties are incapable of giving consent wala namang requirement na there should be in write, uh, a contract in writing even if let's say the agent executes a written contract it doesn't change the fact that he has exceeded his authority also halimbawa they are both incapable of giving consent even though they execute a written contract that written contract is useless because the issue here is the fact that they are both incapable of giving consent okay so yung written written requirement na yan dun lang yan sa statute of frauds Ayan. Okay. So, what are agreements that are covered by the statute of frauds and should be in writing? So, agreements, number one, agreements not to be performed within a year from the making thereof. In other words, they agree now but they defer execution of that contract to another year. Ayan. So, there should be an evidence of that agreement. Otherwise, if there is no agreement, when the, the, the time comes, it cannot be enforced. Okay, so that uh, written agreement should be will become the basis for the enforcement of that contract a year later. Okay, next, special promise to answer for a debt, default, or miscarriage of another, such as a guarantee or a surety ship, so it should be in writing. Also, agreement in consideration of marriage other than mutual promise to marry. So, example, um, marriage settlement or a prenuptial, antino, prenup, a prenuptial agreement. Kasi pag anti-nuptial after na yan, di ba? So, pre-nuptial agreement. Ayan. So, that is, uh, that should be in writing. Okay, next. Agreement for the sale of goods, etc. at a price not less than 500 pesos. O, di ba? Naalala yung Article 1358, any contract involving um, an amount of money more than 500, 500 pesos should also be in writing even if it's in a private document o oh, consistent siya dito sa 1403 number 2 that it should also be in writing if the price is more than 500 pesos next contracts of lease for a period longer than 1 year should also be in writing but if it's less than 1 year then a verbal agreement is valid um, and enforceable okay, sorry enforceable lang tayo dito yung words word na gagamitin natin dito enforceable lang Kasi yung valid na talaga siya. It's just that uh, it's unenforceable. Next, agreements for the sale of real property or interest therein, okay, regardless of the price. Also, representation as to the credit of a third person. So, similar parang surety with it. Okay, or, uh, or security, yes. Any security or any accommodation should also be in writing. Now, if it's not in writing... It does not comply with the statute of frauds. Thus, it cannot be enforced. Okay? Ayan. Ganun ka strict a statute of frauds. It cannot be enforced. Kaya tumunta ka sa court, kung wala ka namang ebidensya in writing, then it's useless. Kaya notice that kahit ang, ang small claims requires that it should be in, at least there should be evidence in writing. Pero just because wala ka evidence in writing, it doesn't mean na hindi mo na pwedeng ma-pursue ang small claims mo. Kasi if you look at the form there, may tinatanong pa doon any other evidence that you have to prove the the debt or the obligation. Ayan. So, paano mo mapuprove yun? Well, the civil code also suggests what other evidence can be presented in order to prove a contract that to, or rather to make the contract enforceable ito na the statute of frauds requires that the contract be evidenced by some note memorandum or any writing but if during the litigation the parties to the action 
did not make any objection to the admissibility of oral evidence. For example, yung complainant or yung plaintiff nag-testify about the loan. Okay? Although it was not in writing, but he made or he testified on the loan verbally. Okay, that it was a verbal agreement that uh, I, I delivered to him the amount and then he paid to me, let's say, a, a partial amount, but then he never paid again. Ayan. So, obviously, the, obviously the, the contract is merely verbal. If the defendant fails to object to that, then that uh, failure to object is considered uh, that uh, oral contract now becomes binding as if there was a written agreement. Okay? Now, next is that when uh, we say that the statute of frauds applies only to executory contracts. This means that if the contract has been partially or completely executed, then the statute of frauds does not apply. So, in both instances, the two exceptions operate as ratification of the contract. <clears throat> So, yun ang ibig ko sabihin kayo na, na even in small claims or any other case, kahit wala kang evidence in writing, but if it is ratified through, let's say, an admission, okay, like kalimbawa, text message, sabi niya, ang, ang sagot nung, nung may utang sa'yo, oh, pasensya ka na kasi uh, may, medyo kipit lang ako ngayon. Di ba, libabayaran kita sa katapusan. Ayan, that's already an admission. Okay, next, what if the the contract was already partially executed by, let's say, the delivery of the thing? Let's say it's a contract of sale, the property has been delivered uh, to to the buyer, and the buyer has, in fact, uh, possessed uh, and occupied the property. So, in that case, the contract has been partially executed on the part of the seller. So, wala na, hindi na madideny ni buyer yung kontrata. The contrata has already crossed, okay? the line so to speak uh, that requires that the contract be in writing it has now um, left okay, the world of the statute of fraud so to speak alright now let's finally we will talk about void and inexistent contracts wait lang <clears throat> kamusta na kaya kayo dyan nandyan pa ba kayo ah yes 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 correct under the new rules, kailangan na po i-attach. Yes. So, kung wala ka namang ebidensya, wala kang i-attach, di ba? E di, ang, ang, ang strategy mo is ipatestify mo yung witness mo. And then, if the witness testifies on an oral contract, kasi nga, ano naman i-attach mo sa, sa complaint mo kung the contract is oral? Di ba? Picture. Oh, picture, nag-exchange kayo yung pera, ganyan. Pero anyway, pwede naman, text messages, sulat, demand letter, lahat yung attach mo. But then kasi, ang tanong, will that be considered as ratification? Yes, maybe, pero kung hindi, pero kung i-object ka niya ng, ng defend that, eh di bali wala yung demand letter mo, at saka yung mga text messages mo. But the best way is to have your witness or the, the, the creditor testify. And if he testifies, his oral testimony, of course, testimony is oral. No? So oral testimony, if unrefuted, uh, becomes evidence of the of the uh, unwritten contract. Ayan. Okay, thanks Nadine. Okay, next. Nasaan na tayo? Void contracts. So, void contracts and inexistent contracts. Wait. So, what are the void or inexistent contracts? Specifically, what are the grounds? So, Article 1409 of the Civil Code provides that those whose cause, object, or purpose is contrary to law, morals, good customs, public order, public policy. Also, those which are absolutely simulated or fictitious. Also, those whose cause or object did not exist at the time of the transaction. Those whose object is outside the commerce of man. Those where the intention of the parties relative to the principal object of the contract cannot be ascertained and those expressly prohibited by or declared void by law. Okay, so clearly uh, the contract is void because of a defect in the object or the cause. Okay, because if it's just consent, then it's either voidable or unenforceable. Okay, now, um, as I said, uh, kailangan meron lang kayong ready na knowledge, no? Hopefully, uh, your your stock knowledge about kung anong bawal is wide enough. So, when when you are presented with a problem, uh, dapat isipin nyo na um, 
baka merong batas na nagbabawal nito. Ayan. So, isipin nyo lagi, o, diba? Okay. It appears that on its face, it's it's okay. Or that it's it's valid. But then, try to be the devil's advocate at isipin nyo, baka hindi pwede to. So, alam mo yun? Uh, but then, of course, when taking the bar, you don't have the luxury of time na maging skeptic ka na para isipin mo, parang hindi pwede to eh. Ah, ganun ganun ka tapos mauubos na oras mo kakaisip kung bakit hindi siya pwede okay so yun but okay syempre meron na mga times na kita kita mo naman on its way aba this is void foreigner wanting to buy property in the Philippines oh uh, property covered by carp and then it's being sold within the prohibitive period oh okay uh, what else um Uh, kidney or, or body organs being sold in the public market oh hindi rin pwede to so yung mga ganong mga ano talagang they become like an enlightened fact no or discoveries okay lang yun pero yung mga iba isipin nyo try nyo muna okay look at the elements are the elements present look at the form has the form been met tapos finally tingnan mo itong um, grounds for void and inexistent contracts kasi madalas ang tanong basta contracts is the contract valid or is the contract void can the contract be enforced etc okay so yan yung mga list so try to just familiarize yourself with that okay now some notes on void contracts a void contract produces no legal effect so there are no rights and obligations that can arise <clears throat> from a void contract next it cannot be confirmed or ratified Third, the action to declare the nullity of a contract and the right to set up the defense of nullity of a contract does not prescribe. So, imprescriptible yan. Notice that resistible and voidable contracts have a prescriptive period of four years, but uh, a void contract can be, um, or an action to declare a contract void can be filed anytime. Okay? Because walang prescriptive period. Okay, third, or fourth, If the contract has been performed, the restoration of what has been given is in order. In other words, meron ding restitution. But take note, where the parties are mutually guilty or are in pari delicto, they will not have any right of recovery. Now, exception to the exception is when the rule will violate a public policy. So in other words, if there is a public policy against, let's say, foreign ownership, then uh, you cannot... Um, apply in pari delicto to keep the parties, let's say the Filipino and the foreigner, where they are. So, there should be restitution just the same because to allow the foreigner or to hold the foreigner uh, in pari delicto and to keep him where he is, that will allow him to keep the property which in the first place he has no right to hold or to own. And, okay. Okay, now we have some exercises. So, babasahin ko lang to um, for my students in uh, in Uilo. Uh, please email me your answers. My email address is ajumrani2000 at gmail .com. I'm sure you remember that to go from our previous um, assignment or exercise. Where I also ask you to email me your answers. Pero, yun na, para hindi na kayo mag-type dito. Um, but, of course, you are also free to type your answers naman. But, for for me to be able to read them, um, and then, of course, para walang limitations dun sa space and all that. Uh, although, I discourage you from writing your answers too long, no? But you can send me your answer to these questions to my email address ajumrani2000 at yahoo no, sorry, at gmail.com Okay? Alright, so let's look at the first problem. So, Greeley, an, inter an, in an Italian national and Rebecca, a Filipina were common law partners Greeley gave money to Rebecca for her to buy a beach lot in Siargao Island and to register it in her name Then they executed a contract of lease which stipulated, among others, that Greeley would rent the lot for a period of 50 years to be uh, automatically renewed for another 50 years for a monthly rental of 10,000 pesos and that Rebecca as the lessor was prohibited from selling, donating, or encumbering the said lot except with the written consent of Greeley. Also, they executed a memorandum of agreement whereby Rebecca 
acknowledge that the money used in buying the property belonged to Greeley and that should they separate, Rebecca must deliver the property to Greeley. Subsequently, they broke up and Greeley ordered Rebecca to vacate the property. Rebecca, however, claimed that the contract of lease and MOA are void and countercharged for ejectment. Okay, so, <clears throat> uh, simply natin to. So, you have a foreigner, had a girlfriend in the Philippines, they decided to buy a property in, it in Italy, tuloy, in Siargao, but because the Italian can't buy the property, he gave the money to Rebecca, Rebecca bought the property, the title was in the name of Rebecca. Now, for the foreigner to be able to make use of the property, Rebecca executed a contract of lease with Greeley so that Greeley can stay in the property. But the lease contract is good for 50 years, renewable for another 50 years. Okay, So that's a total of 100 years. Now, in addition, the lessor's right to sell, encumber, or alienate the property is impaired, meaning Rebecca cannot sell, alienate, or encumber the property without the consent of Greeley. And in addition to that lease contract, they also entered into a memorandum of agreement whereby Rebecca acknowledges that the money in purchasing the property belongs to Greeley and that they agreed, both of them, Rebecca and Greeley, that should they separate, Greeley has to return the money. To, sorry, Rebecca has to return the money to Greeley. And no, not the money, but Rebecca has to deliver the property to Greeley. Ayan. So, ibig sabihin, hindi talaga lalabas, hindi talaga aalis si Greeley sa property. Okay, so the questions are, are the contract of lease and MOA valid? Why? Will the in pari delicto rule apply and the parties left where they are? Why? So, yan po ang katanungan. That's the first uh, set of questions okay, for you on, with respect to the first question, first problem. Okay, so if you need to review, you can just, you know, watch back this uh, video. Basta yan yung una yung question. And um, there are two more. Okay, so the next question is this. Rochelle was selling her house and lot in Kawit, Cavite for 5 million pesos. She verbally appointed her friend, Dessa, as her agent, who then offered the property to Lynette, who accepted and paid 200000 as partial payment out of the 5 million purchase price. When Lynette went to Rochelle to give the check for the balance of the purchase price, Rochelle refused and told Lynette that she's not bound because the contract was void and or unenforceable because uh, since the contract of agency to sell was not in writing as required under Article 1403 and Article 1874 of the Civil Code. Okay. So, ulitin natin, ha? Rochelle has property. Uh, she appointed verbally. Okay, her friend Dessa to sell that property. Now Dessa was able to convince Lynette to buy the property. Lynette paid two hundred thousand pesos as partial payment to Dessa. Let's just assume it's Dessa. Si wala naman dito eh. Kasi dito na ngayon una sila nakita ni Rochelle. So uh, Lynette now went to see uh, Rochelle to pay the balance, which is four million eight hundred thousand pesos. But uh, Rochelle didn't accept it, uh, saying that the contract of sale entered between you and Dessa is void because it was not an, it, it was not in writing. My contract or my agency to sell between myself and uh, Dessa was not in writing. Ayan. So void and unenforceable daw yung sale. Okay. So the questions are, is the contract of sale void or unenforceable? And next, is Rochelle correct that she is not bound by the contract? Alright, so those are the questions in relation to, the, to that problem. So, yan. isama nyo yan sa sagot nyo na i-email nyo sa akin. Again, it's ajumrani2000 at gmail.com Okay, last question. XYZ Bank was ordered by the Banco Central ng Pilipinas to divest itself of real property investments so as to preserve its liquidity. However, most of these real properties were locations for XYZ Bank's branches. So XYZ Bank formed ABC Corporation and sold to this ABC Corporation the affected real properties. 
Simultaneously, ABC Corporation leased back the properties to XYZ Bank. But technically, it just happened all in paper. No? There was really no transfer of property. XYZ Bank stayed in these properties. Now, later, XYZ Bank never paid rent to ABC Corporation. So, several years later, ABC Corporation sued XYZ Bank for ejectment on the ground of non-payment of rent. XYZ Bank countered that there was an unwritten trust agreement between XYZ Bank and ABC Corporation with the latter ABC Bank, uh, ABC Corporation holding the properties in trust for the former XYZ Bank. Okay, so you have a bank which had properties way more than what was allowed for it to uh, own. And the Banco Central said, oh, medyo sumobra sa obra na ang mga properties nyo. You had to divest yourself, sell them. Okay, so ang ginawa ni XYZ Bank, nagtayo siya ng ibang kumpanya, ABC Corporation, to transfer or to sell these properties to ABC Bank. But ABC Bank executed a contract of lease so that XYZ Bank can remain in the property. Later on, ABC Bank or ABC Corporation sued for ejectment. Sabi naman ni, ni XYZ, you cannot sue me for ejectment because I own the property. You are merely a trustee. Okay, We had an unwritten okay? because it was not executed as a separate or a distinct trust agreement. But rather, they just had these two contracts, contract of sale and a lease contract. So, sabi ni XYZ Bank, you are a trustee. We have an unwritten trust relationship over these real properties. So you cannot sue me for ejectment because kaya kitang, uh, kaya kitang idemanda for the recovery of the property. But then that's something else now. Okay, so the question is this. Is the alleged trust agreement between XYZ Bank and ABC Corporation enforceable? Why? And, and next. Okay, by the way, tandaan nyo at pansinin nyo tanong ha. Pag sinabi natin enforceable, then check Article 1403 or any other law that requires a specific form, okay? Or whether it should be in writing. Yeah. Alam mo yung, it's, it's good to read the label. Okay, it's good to read the question. So, ito, enforceability, huwag nyo akong bibigyan ng sasabihin nyo sa akin na, ah, it's void because ganito, ganyan, ganyan, it's against public policy. Doon mo sa second question yan, sagutin kung totoo nga talagang this is against public policy. Because in the second question, the question is with respect to the validity of the trust agreement. And applying the law on void contracts, pansin nyo, when is a contract void? It is void when the object or the cause is invalid or illegal. O, kaya gamitin, tingnan nyo yung grounds for void contracts if you want to answer this question. The second question, which is that, is the trust agreement valid and why? Yan. So, ayun. So, don't forget, sa mga sudyante ko na, <coughs> na nanunod ngayon, um, please send your answers, very short answers, basta short but comprehensive to my email address agiomani2000 at gmail.com no later than okay, 12 midnight tonight okay para tis wala nakiisipin bukas so no later than 12 midnight tonight okay so I'll be expecting your um, emails by 12 midnight late emails will not be accepted okay tira nga natin meron pa ba mga last ano uh, landmark cases pwede na libro yung civil law youtube slides niya okay sayang di ko na simulan pwede mo pa rin simulan to zoo taben panoorin mo lang ulit pagka na upload niya siya tapos replay ayan may replay hindi po siya replay uh, ba? yes yes you can watch it again so blue falcon sir past bar exams na lang at landmark cases pwede na libro yung civil code law yes yes oo nga pero <coughs> Sige na, kailangan pa natin pag una ng pansin niya. At sa probably, I'll just make my book na lang in case I will have to add uh, cases and discussion of past bar exams. So, yeah. Baby steps. Baby steps. And then, uh, in the meantime, my intention here is to just help you, no? To be an added resource for bar reviewees and for students. I'm sure there are so many legal resources out there we have uh, very good books very good authors very good uh, youtube channels uh, on on the subject so dagdag nyo lang to i mean diba, the more the merrier ayan okay so 
I think I've covered everything. So I'd like to thank you all for watching. Now, you can see on the screen my social media accounts. You can find me on Facebook. My Facebook page is Attorney Al Jumrani. And of course, you're watching my YouTube channel. This is The House of Law. I thank you all for watching. I thank you all for the support for watching my videos. And um, watch out for more videos. My plan is for next meeting, dahil nga civilo talaga ang area ko. So, magsisivilo na lang ako. And, <laughs> para mo napipilitan lang. Hindi kasi paminsan, di ba, para naman, mag, para naman maiba naman tayo. Pero, yeah. I plan on, in the immediate future, and by immediate, siguro in a few days. <laughs> Ayan. Uh, in, a few, in a few days, I'm going to uh, make a video about, kasi nga, tapos na ako sa law and persons, di ba, yung background of the family code. So, magpa-family code na tayo. Pero, mukhang marriage lang muna kasi nga hindi kaya ng uh, entire entire one hour or two hours yung entire family code so yung marriage muna at saka para hindi kayo mag data overload or information overload okay so that's it from me thank you very much for watching please like if you enjoyed this video please subscribe if you haven't yet and please click that notification bell so that you will be notified in case I upload a new video. So, laging tatandaan, isip ay buksan, alamin ang batas. Bye!